tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Corey was at the bar getting himself another old-fashioned with an Irish stout chaser. When he stopped to look toward the back of the bar, he saw someone on his way up from the outside smoking patio. Someone that looked familiar, but he couldn't place them. That was the way it went at the bar, wasn't it? Maybe they'd recognize him and come up to speak to him. That would make the whole thing easier. Then he would just have to smile and go, Oh yeah, hey, how are you? Corey paid the bartender, left a cash tip on the bar top, and carried one drink in each hand as he made his way back to the patio out back. He stared at the drinks and concentrated on not spilling them. It was more difficult than it sounded, as he'd already had a few. Corey preferred to go to the bar with company, but sometimes it was nice to come alone and make friends here. He wasn't married, he didn't have any kids, he just had his job, his apartment, his cat, and his freedom to do whatever the hell he pleased. Some days, like today, what pleased him was to knock back a few and maybe go home with a stranger. STIs were scary, but he always had condoms and insisted upon using them even when his partners didn't want him to. Even when Corey was wasted, his principles were intact. Corey stopped at the back door to the bar. He sipped his liquor and then used his butt to push the door open. Then he slipped outside before it hit him and caused a spill. Everyone that was out there, smoking and mingling, looked up when he came through the door. They always did. That was the way. He did it himself. They wanted to see who'd arrived, if it was someone worth talking to, or maybe more. Just me, he wanted to say with a laugh. Go back to your drinks and your dates. Corey set his drinks on one of the tall tables and tugged his cigarettes from his pants pocket. A hand came before him, holding a lighter. He leaned into the flame, took a drag, and thanked the smiling blonde who walked away with a confident swagger. Maybe he should follow her, he thought. She had that look in her eye. Tonight could end well. Before he could make a move, someone else came to his table blocking the blonde from his line of sight. Corey frowned and sipped his liquor, following it immediately with the stout. We need to talk, the newcomer said. Corey looked at them clearly for the first time and realized that it was the man he'd seen earlier. I know you, Corey said, eyeing him with curiosity. Well, I sure hope so, the man said giving Corey a wide smile and showing his near-perfect teeth. Corey looked away and went back to his drinks, felt embarrassed. He had no idea who this man was, only that he was familiar. Yet it seemed the man expected him to know more. This was awkward, and Corey wished he'd moved to follow the blonde woman before this man had moved in. He sighed. So, what do we need to talk about, he asked wanting to get this strange interaction over with. Your childhood, the man said, flashing his smile again. Corey took a drag off of his cigarette. That's why you seem familiar, but I can't place you, he said after blowing out smoke. Or someone I knew as a child? The man nodded. He smoked a cigarette of his own that Corey hadn't noticed in his hand before now. That felt strange because he should have at least seen the smoke trailing up before the guy, but he didn't remember seeing any smoke but his own. Then again, he was a little tipsy, and the guy was outside in the smoking area, so it made sense for him to have a cigarette. Corey wasn't sure why he was thinking about it so much. We were close, the man said. No hint of the smile he wore only moments before. Then he forgot all about me. Now you don't even recognize me or remember me. That's why I'm here. You're at the bar because of me, Corey asked. You were taking a shot in the dark or you knew I came here? I'm sorry, I don't remember this guy from childhood, but this is getting a little weird. It's beginning to feel like he's been stalking me or something. 
I'm in this town because of you, the man said. I live far away from here. I just never got over the way you ditched me and forgot I existed. I wanted to... No, I needed to find you, to make you remember me. Corey took a step back away from the man and stumbled. He was drunker than he realized. Maybe it was time to call it a night and just go home alone before things got messy. Corey reached for his drink and missed, and almost spilled it. He huffed and returned to his cigarette. Look, bud, he said. I'm sorry I can't place you. I'm sorry for whatever happened when we were young. Are you? the man asked, a sinister look in his eye. You worked so hard to move on, to erase me from your life. Now you're sorry you did? Curry looked at the man, studied him. It wasn't the face that gave him away as much as the voice. Was it possible? Could this man before him be the monster that tormented his dreams as a kid. No, that was impossible, wasn't it? That man wasn't even real. He was a figure of Corey's imagination, a product of the trauma caused by his abusive father. If he was showing up almost 20 years later, then it might just be time for Corey to quit drinking. What did you say your name was? Corey asked. I didn't, the man answered, his smile returning. I didn't say my name because I don't have one. Not really. I just am. Many people call me many things. I'm the boogeyman, the monster in the closet, the tooth fairy even. Call me whatever you want, Corey. What was it you called me when you were young? The bad man? That was it. I remember it fondly. Corey shook his head. Someone's messing with me. This can't be real. It isn't. Things like this don't happen. Your nightmare creature from childhood doesn't come back 20 years later and strike up a conversation with you in a bar. Who are you, really? Is this your idea of a joke? How'd you find out about my nightmares? Psychiatrists aren't supposed to divulge those things to people, but Dr. Simon must have. That's the only way you could know about the bad man. The other man actually laughed at him. Or maybe I was there. How much fun it used to be to come out of your closet or crawl from under your bed to watch your eyes grow and grow until that scream burst from your lips. Shut up! Who the hell is this guy? What does he want? The stranger laughed again. You remember what happened next, don't you? Of course I do. That was a long time ago. It doesn't matter. I think I need some water. Corey looked around the room for someone that could provide a distraction, help him out of this bizarre situation. Everyone seemed engrossed in their own conversation. It almost seemed like they were purposely trying not to look at him. Your father would come into your room. He was furious that you woke him, and he'd scream and hit you, and you would scream and cry, and I... <laughs> I would hide and watch. I said, shut up. The stranger's smile only widened. When your father left to return to bed, I'd come back and terrorize you some more, but you were just as afraid of your father as you were of me, and maybe more so. So you refused to cry, and you refused to yell. You just squeezed your eyes shut tight like that would make me go away, and, and you would wet the bed. Enough, Corey shouted. What the hell do you want? I just want you back, Corey. I want to be friends again. You're insane. I am? Who are you? Look around you. Corey turned away from him. When I looked at the people standing around, they quickly looked away from him. What the hell is going on? Did somebody put something in my drink? Corey turned back to the man, claiming to be his childhood nightmare. Can they see you? The man across from him winked. No, sirree. They think you are nuts. Look at that blonde girl you were talking to earlier. Take a look. Corey watched the man step out of the way so he could see the woman that lit his cigarette for him. She was staring straight at him, and she looked afraid. He wanted to apologize to her, but what would he even say? Instead, Corey looked back at the bad man and nodded. 
I have to take this conversation away from the public. I wish I could take my drinks to go. But somehow, I think I'm still going to need them. I don't know if they have enough alcohol in the building to get me through whatever's going on, though. Corey downed his old-fashioned, then he grabbed his beer and headed for the door that led into the bar. He looked back at the man that only he could see and said, Come on. Then he opened the door and stumbled into the bar. He downed what was left in his bottle and left it on the bar as he walked by en route for the front door of the establishment. You gonna be all right? The bartender called after him. You want me to call you an Uber? I'm walking, Corey told him. And then he marched out the door into the cool night air and lit up another cigarette. He took a long drag off of it and watched the door waiting for it to reopen. He knew the other man was following him, and the guy wasn't done yet. He wasn't just going to let Corey leave. Where the hell was he? A voice spoke from behind him, talking softly into his right ear. Where are we headed? You gonna take me to see your new bedroom? I hope I can fit under your bed still. Corey whipped around and glared at the man. Of course, he doesn't have to use doors, does he? Corey's gaze passed over the other people standing out front, and more coming and going, and he held his tongue. Instead of speaking, he just started walking, knowing that the other man would follow. He walked past prying ears and kept going until he reached the park. Corey glanced over and scoffed at the smile that was waiting for him. All right, he said, entering the park and walking the dirt road under the overhanging trees. Talk. Tell me what you really want from me. The bad man walked with a skip in his step. He swayed and spun, almost dancing. You remember when you were 12 years old? That was the year you left me. The year my father died, Corey said. That's right. With him gone, things got a little easier for you to work with. Your mom got you into therapy, and then you started seeing that psychiatrist who put you on meds, and you even got a girlfriend. You were messed up, sure, but you weren't afraid anymore. That was just it. You literally looked at me and told me to go away. You said I wasn't real. Corey sat down on the bench beside the duck pond. So what? You're pissed off that I grew up? The bad man's smile fell away. A wave of anger fell over his face, a muscle spasming in his cheek. His eyes burned with hatred. His lip curled up and then relaxed. No, he said. More relaxed now, but still with an edge to his voice. Everyone I visit grows up, Corey. The thing is, they all take me with them. I'm a lasting trauma. Something they try not to talk about with their spouses, but always feel and remember. I'm the reason they still stare at the floor beneath their bed when they enter the room at night or pack their closet so full that they know no one could fit in there. I'm the reason they go running when they hear their kids cry out, awakened from a nightmare because they're so afraid what happened to them is going to happen to their children. The fear of me is lifelong, and it spreads like a disease. You don't just get over it. Corey flinched as the man screamed his final words. Okay, he said quietly. The man bent over and stared into his face. He was snarling now, his eyes like burning embers. Corey nodded at the sight of him. This was the bad man he remembered. This is what was missing. The fury. The evil. That was why he looked familiar but different. Why Corey couldn't place him before. So why did you wait until now to come back? If you were so pissed that I stopped caring about you, then why didn't you haunt me sooner? Two guys jogging the trail by the pond turned their heads and glared at Corey. Freaking addicts are everywhere now, one of them said. I'm seriously thinking of moving, the other answered. Corey watched them jog past and he sighed. Eh, I wish I was on drugs. I did try to get you back before now, the bad man said. I was so angry. I lashed out. You were 16. 
you hadn't mentioned me in your therapy sessions. You didn't draw pictures of me in your journal or wake up in a cold sweat remembering the way I used to torment you. I'm always watching, waiting to come up, but I never did. So I took it out on your girlfriend. Corey jumped up from the bench and he stormed off. That's bullcrap, he said as he went. She moved away. You're just trying to scare me, to make yourself relevant again. So you dated for years, and she moved away without so much as saying goodbye? Corey was talking so fast, the bad man had to run to keep up with him. If it's not true, then why are you running away, Corey? That's the truth of what happened when you were young, isn't it? You didn't stop being afraid, you just ran away. Hid from the memories, took meds to block me out. It was the alcohol, wasn't it? Corey said as he stomped through the park. That's why I was able to see you and talk to you again after all these years. The bad man's voice came from the other side now, whispering into his other ear. That's right. You claim to be healed, to be over me. But you spend your nights drinking alone at a bar and stumbling home. You're not over anything. Corey growled. You have no idea what you're talking about. I'm a social drinker. I don't usually drink alone. And even if I start off that way, I don't end the night that way. I could have gone home with that blonde if you hadn't showed up and ruined it. Believe what you want to believe. Doesn't she look at all familiar to you? Don't all the blondes you meet here when you're drunk? Corey stopped in his tracks. She looked like Lindsay, he said, more to himself. She's the one thing I never got over. Because she left you without so much as a goodbye, and you were so in love, Corey. You thought you were going to get married and live happily ever after. And to this day, you can't understand why you didn't. You're constantly drawn to women that look like what she would look like if she were still alive. Take them home and make love to them, but you won't ever date them or start a relationship because you don't trust them to stay, to not break your heart the way sweet little Lindsay did. I made sure that fear and hurt she caused lingered because my own didn't. Corey threw a punch at him, but his fist only sliced through the night air. He swung again and again. She's not dead, he snarled as he tried to hit the man who just disappeared and reappeared at will, laughing at him in his pent-up anger. She moved away. Get a load of this guy, someone said as they walked by, drinking a beer in a paper bag. Another young man next to him, with a similar choice in beverage, said, First rule of Fight Club. And the two of them laughed hysterically. Screw you, Corey yelled. He lowered his head and charged at him. a boy! The bad man said from behind him as he ran. The young men yelled out, Whoa! and then laughed some more. Corey swung his fist at them the same way he had at the man of his childhood nightmares, and just the same, his punches failed to connect with anything. And the boys laughed and threw their beer cans at him before running away. Oh, Corey, a voice said in his ear, You can do better than that, can't you? That's just pitiful. I mean, I knew you couldn't hit me, but you should have been able to beat those brats into submission. Has anyone ever told you that you drink too much? Corey fell to his knees, put his hands to his head and covered his ears, squinting his eyes shut tight. Just shut up, he said. You're not any more real now than you were back then. I'm not going to let you do this to me. Just go away, I'm done. Are you really, though? That man's voice traveled like he was walking circles around Corey as he sat upon the ground. You were just trying to pick up another girl that looked like Lindsay. And you mean to tell me you really want me to leave? You don't want to find out what actually happened to her? She moved away, Corey said without opening his eyes. You're not real. Go away. The bad man laughed. <laughs> and tell me, Corey. Why you were never able to find her? I told you, I'm always watching, waiting on my moment. I know you've been looking for her for years. You called people and searched social media. Even her parents didn't know what happened to her. 
That was strange, wasn't it? They just had that note I watched her write. The one that said she was running away and going to live a better life. Corey's eyes snapped open, and he stared angrily at the smiling man before him. And that's what happened. Her father wasn't any better than mine. That's what drew us together. Understanding and compassion through shared trauma. She had reason to run away. I just wish she'd told me, or given me the chance to come with her. I would have gone. I would have gone. The bad man stared into Corey's eyes and grinned. And she would have asked. And deep down, you've always known that. You've always known that something terrible happened to her. Corey felt defeated. His shoulders slumped and his head hung down, his eyes on the ground. Tell me, what did you do? Tell me. The bad man backed away and stood, Corey's gaze following him as he did so. You didn't come to this park by coincidence, Corey. You always walked this way because you used to come here with Lindsay. You came here because she was on your mind, because she's always on your mind. It's no different than the blondes at the bar. What did you do? Corey snapped. The bad man simply smiled. I'll show you. I'll make it all make sense, and in turn, make sure that you never forget me again. Go to your special place. The place where you and Lindsay used to go to hide away from your dad's and feel safe. Even after your own dad passed, her dad kept your fear of him alive and well. Come on, let's go, lead the way. Corey went to the walking bridge, and he stepped into the stream that ran under it. He looked around just like he did when he was in high school to make sure that no one was looking. He could almost feel Lindsay next to him. Not a day went by that he didn't miss her. When he judged the coast to be clear, he crawled under the bridge that was barely above the ground. His clothes got soaked in the stream. He reached down into the water and grabbed big rocks, removing them from a piece of rotted old wood. Then he moved the wood, and there was a metal cover. He strained to lift it from the water. I knew you would still remember the way, the bad man said from behind him. Corey looked over to find the man squatting next to him, looking joyous and gleeful. Corey just snorted and went back to the task at hand. He needed to prove to himself that all of this was in his head, that nothing was down there. He needed to see with his own drunken eyes that Lindsay had moved and the bad man wasn't real. Then he could talk to his therapist all about it next week when they met again. Once the metal cover was removed, Corey slipped into the exposed end of the pipe, sliding down in water that spilled in from the stream. He remembered doing the same with Lindsay and laughing together before kissing when they reached the bottom. Come on, he could hear her say in his memory. Corey ran along the tunnel until he reached a hole in the wall and he climbed through it. It's still here. I can't believe it's still here after all this time. I guess it was pretty well hidden. This is it, he said out loud then. You put the metal lid on yourself and Lindsay covered it with cardboard. He stole it from the manhole by the school. Do you remember? Of course. It was heavy as hell and crazy, but Lindsay was afraid that the wood wasn't enough, that her father would find our special place and make it terrible just like home. But he never did. I don't think so. I'm pretty sure he would have killed both of us if he had. That's why you still come this far in and went through the wall into this place after coming down here just to be safe. You were both safe here. Safe together, right? This was your special place, where you could be together and nothing could hurt either of you. That's right, Corey said, but now he was feeling nervous. Except it isn't. If it didn't get too wet on the way down here, take your phone out and turn on the flashlight. Corey wanted to argue to snap at his childhood monster again, but he was too afraid, so he just did as the bad man said. When he had the flashlight on, he cast the light around the room, illuminating the scene a few feet at a time. It was on his third sweep that he saw her. She was little more than a skeleton now, sitting up in the corner. 
She was still wearing the floral print baby doll dress she used to wear all the time because he liked it. No, it couldn't be her, right? It had to be somebody else. Surely someone else had found this place other than them. Maybe someone overdosed. No one ever found this place, the bad man told him. It was yours, and it still is yours, just like Lindsay. Do you believe me now? Do you fear me now? Corey started to shake. He whipped around with a fury to glare at the bad man, but he wasn't over there. He could feel him on his other side, and Corey screamed, whipping around again. The bad man laughed as Corey jammed a finger into his smiling face. What did you do? What the hell did you do? You told me you'd tell me. You said you'd make it make sense. So make it make sense, damn it. What did you do? The bad man offered his signature smile. I didn't do anything, Corey. I'm not real. Suddenly, Corey found himself alone with a skeleton that had been hidden away for so long, and he collapsed, sobbing. He crawled across the floor and took the old bones into his arms. He coughed from the dust and cried into the dress that had all but disintegrated over the years. Uh-oh. At just over one year old, my daughter Josephine didn't say much, but she had a few expressions that she used regularly. Uh-oh was one of them. She would use it when her unsteady legs would fail her and she would wipe out, or when she would sling oatmeal onto the floor after a botched attempt to scoop it onto her spoon. The expression made me smile, even when I had a mess to clean. To my frustration, she had another expression that was not so appealing. Ghost. The first time she said it, she was lying on her change table while I changed her dirty diaper. She generally flailed around like a wild animal, but she was strangely calm that night, simply sucking her thumb and staring up, her gaze directed into the upper corner of her room. Honey, what are you looking at? I asked, smiling. She pointed a small finger up to the corner. Mama, ghost. I knew it made no sense, but I was afraid to look. However, I had to reassure her that it was nothing. After a short, internal pep talk, I sheepishly glanced up into the corner. There was nothing there obviously. See, honey, there's nothing to be afraid of. There's no ghost. I was ashamed of myself for even thinking twice about it. My sister Charlotte was right. My ex-husband changed me. Dave was overbearing and aggressive, and he would undermine me constantly. Two weeks after Josephine was born, he had his bags packed chastising me on his way out the door. I could still remember the last thing he said to me. Abby, you wanted this kid, not me. You forced me into it, so now you're going to deal with it yourself. Charlotte was a hand on my shoulder after it happened, and surprisingly, often a logical counter to my illogical thoughts. Dave was wrong for me in every way. But sometimes, we can't see it. Or, in my case, don't want to see it. Unfortunately, even though he had been gone for over a year, his impact on my psyche lingered. Once, confident and bold, I was a shell of that person. The preposterous thought of a ghost hiding in the corner of my daughter's room had me averting my gaze. From that night on, Josephine would point that little finger at the exact same spot, and I would hesitantly play the role of defender and reassure her there was no ghost. 
I reasoned that she must have picked something up from one of those spooky kids videos I let her watch on the tablet. Or maybe it was an imaginary friend. Lots of kids had imaginary friends. Josephine didn't stop pointing at that corner. It went on and on every night. So your daughter sees ghosts, huh? I scowled at Charlotte. She had flown in from the West Coast to stay with me for the week. She wanted to help with Josephine as much as she could, including putting her to bed. I should have made up some excuse to do it myself, but Charlotte would have sensed something was wrong. She was good at that. It's nothing, Char. You know, this is the exact type of behavior that makes these types of things persist. I mean, this tendency for people to ignore anything that makes them uncomfortable is... T okay, okay, fine. I held up my hands, trying to avoid one of her lectures. What do you want to know? How long has she been doing this? About a month. Does she always point to the same spot? Yes. Have you seen anything strange? I paused, just for a moment before answering. No. Stupid. She caught my hesitation. Charlotte glared at me. There had been a few oddities, sure, but they were easily explained away and nothing that Charlotte had to know about. Had I awoken to a sound from Josephine's room one night and, glancing at the video baby monitor, believed that I'd seen something or someone leaning over her crib? Yes, but I blinked and it was gone. That could easily be chalked up to the fog of sleep, the poor picture quality of the monitor, and too many horror movies before bed. On another occasion, had I thought I felt a hand brush through my hair as I was placing Josephine in her crib? Yes, I had. But again, I was living alone for the first time in my life with a young baby to look after because my husband had just abandoned me. My fragile mind was playing tricks on me. I looked back at Charlotte. So? I asked. You probably have a trapped spirit in there, Charlotte said. <laughs> Come on. Charlotte gave me a look I had seen before, one of concern and distress. Her voice was soft and sincere. I care about you and Josephine. I'm just telling you what I think. I know you sometimes shrug me off and think I'm a nut, and look, frankly, sometimes I don't blame you. But this time... It really feels like something. I sensed a presence. Well, I wasn't going to fight back now. So what do I do? I asked. Spirits are typically people who have passed on and got, well, stuck in our plane of existence. I and mean, most are just innocent observers. You can be sure, though, that all of them are confused and they can become dangerous if they aren't handled properly. Are the Ghostbusters busy, you think? She ignored my poor attempt at humor. Most spirits don't understand where they are. This could be the spirit of, say, a mother who left behind a child and believes Josephine is her daughter. I mean, maybe she sees you as a threat. So what do I do? <laughs> the only way to get rid of a spirit is to confront it and demand that it leave. I laughed. <laughs> demand that it leave. Well, people are scared to confront the unknown, so spirits can linger for years. You have to make it understand that it doesn't belong here. I shook my head. I can't even see this so-called spirit. Not sure how I'm supposed to confront it. She shrugged. Well, the mind of a child is so different than that of an adult. Funny enough, Josephine even recognizes this thing as a ghost rather than how it appears to her likely as a human. She has no fear, but she certainly sees and acknowledges it. I mean, adults believe that ghosts aren't real because they don't fit into our rational view of the world. I guess you just have to think with a little less rationality. I took a deep breath. <sighs> this is crazy, Char. <laughs> a few years ago, you would have marched up to that room and yelled at that corner just to shut me up. Charlotte said, grinning a bit. You mean before Dave? Of course I do. Charlotte replied, 
He's gone now, so I want to see some of that old Abby spark again. The next night, Charlotte stayed at my parents' place. She insisted on Josephine staying there with her. She could tell I needed a break. It was a Friday night, and a few of my college friends were getting together for some drinks. I indulged, really, for the first time since I'd gotten pregnant with Josephine. After five hours at the table exchanging nostalgic tales of wild nights and downing pitchers of beer like we used to, I was surprised I was able to spit out my address coherently enough that the cabbie could get me home. After stumbling through the door, I went to the fridge and grabbed an old bottle of white wine that had probably been sitting there since the day I moved into the house. It had been a good night, and I didn't want it to end. Even if I was just there alone, ready to pass out watching some garbage movie on TV. Before I crashed down on the couch, a thought struck me. Tonight was a good night, but I could make it a great night if I did something more. Something big. I turned from the inviting couch and marched up the stairs. Throwing the door open to my daughter's bedroom, I flopped down into the rocking chair across from her change table. The unusually bright moonlight beamed through her open curtains. I could see the corner where the so-called ghost resided, very clearly. Flinging an accusatory finger at the corner, I took a big swig of cheap wine before making my slurred statement. All right, you asshole. I'm here now. Come on out. Show yourself. I laughed as I took another deep gulp of wine. Come on, don't be scared. Come out, come out, wherever you are. There was a change at that moment. The room got eerily cold. My hair drifted across my face, as if a window was suddenly opened and the cold winter air had filled the small bedroom. Pushing the hair from my face, I recoiled in shock. There was a woman in the room with me. Her position defied all logic. She faced me, pressed into the upper corner of the room, palms and feet pushed against the wall as if they were stuck there, holding her up in the air in this bizarre position. A long, torn white dress hung from her emaciated figure. Strands of filthy black hair hung across her face. She was pale, almost a gray color. Her skin looked as if it was peeling away from her wrinkled face. She glared at me, her eyes cloudy white. No pupils. She bared her teeth, or what was left of them, and made a hissing sound, like a snake. Paralyzed and feeling lightheaded, I tried to focus on my breathing. Finally, I was able to spit out something. What do you want? I wasn't sure how or if she would respond, but the creature opened her mouth, a seemingly endless, dark void exposed. She spoke, her voice otherworldly. <laughs> Gripping the bottle in my hand, I found my legs and stood. No. No, she's my daughter. The ghost hissed loudly and repeated. My child. She looked like she was preparing to leap off the wall at me. I took a step towards her, Charlotte's words ringing in my head. No! You don't belong here, I shouted, tightening my grip on the wine bottle still in my hand, shuffling with nervous, angry energy. The ghostly woman started to push herself away from the corner. Moment of truth. Get the hell out of my house! I screamed. I wound up like a baseball pitcher, closed my eyes, and threw the wine bottle as hard as I could. Smash! 
I opened my eyes to see. Nothing. The woman was gone. The room felt warm again. The only evidence of the encounter, a pile of glass on the change table and a hole in the now wet drywall. I sat back in the chair, dazed, and stared out the hole in the wall for what must have been hours. Eventually, sleep overtook me. I didn't tell anyone what had transpired that night. Not even Charlotte. I treated Josephine's room like a quarantine zone for the next week. She slept with me, and the door to her room remained shut. After a week of waking up with Josephine's legs resting across my face, I thought it was time to move her back into her bedroom. Not just because I needed sleep. Because I wanted to believe that there was nothing to be afraid of. That we had beaten it. I watched the monitor like a hawk the first night, and all was calm. On the second night, again, all seemed well. I began to drift off to sleep when I was shocked back into consciousness by a shrieking cry. Flinging the covers aside, I bolted to Josephine's room faster than I had moved my entire life. I barreled through the door with such violence that I heard the sound of splitting wood from somewhere on the doorframe. Snatching Josephine up from her crib, I held her as tightly as I could while I moved to turn the lights on. What's wrong, honey? I pleaded for an answer despite her limited vocabulary. After a week of sleeping with me, maybe she just panicked when she had a brief wake up in the night and saw that she was alone. Then Josephine raised her arm and a small finger pointed up at the corner. That corner. Slowly, I looked up in the direction of her finger. Uh-oh, she said. The breath that I'd been holding escaped. Hole, Josephine said. The tension drained from my body. Tears welled up in my eyes. Yes, honey, I said with a smile. Mommy made the hole in the wall. Mommy made that uh uh-oh. I patched up the wall a few days later. For a long time, I waited for Josephine to look up there, to point and tell me the ghost was back. But she never did. Those first few months after it happened were incredibly tense, but I was ready. If anything came back, if anything threatened her, I would be there. I knew that I wouldn't be able to protect her from everything in this world as she grew up. I couldn't protect her from heartbreak, from loss, from all the challenges she would face. But I knew that if I could confront the ghost in the corner, that we would be able to confront everything else life would bring head on. Approximately 334 days ago, according to the Martian calendar, NASA began to use the Perseverance rover for research of the Red Planet. Thanks to the rover, we have learned more about our distant neighbor this year than ever before. But not all of it is for the betterment of mankind. Two microphones aboard the rover have been recording the winds of the Red Planet for quite some time, trying to determine the acoustic differences between our world and Mars. Mars has an unusual atmosphere compared to this planet, with very different temperature, density, and chemistry. These differences have three main effects on the sound you'd hear. The speed of sound... Sounds emitted in the cold Martian atmosphere take slightly longer to get to your ear. With an average surface temperature around negative 81 degrees Fahrenheit, or negative 63 degrees Celsius, Mars has a lower speed of sound, around 540 miles per hour, that is 240 meters per second, compared to about 760 miles per hour or 340 meters per second, on Earth. 
You probably wouldn't notice up close, but over longer distances you definitely would. Imagine trying to hear the roar of a fire, only to realize that the house you were getting to had already burned down. The volume of sound. The level you hear will also be automatically lower on Mars. The Martian atmosphere is about a hundred times less dense than on Earth. That is, there's just a lot less of it. That affects how sound waves travel from the source to the detector, resulting in a softer signal. On Mars, you'd have to be much closer to the source of a sound to hear it at the same volume as you would on Earth. And finally, the quality of the sound. The atmosphere of Mars, which is made up of 96% carbon dioxide, absorbs a lot of higher pitch sounds, so only lower pitch sounds travel long distances. This effect is known as attenuation, a weakening of the signal at certain frequencies, and it would be more noticeable the farther you were from the source. Put together, these three impacts change how you or anything would sound in the atmosphere of Mars. Imagine then the surprise felt when it was recorded only a week ago. What sounded like screaming. I was at my station reviewing the audio and barely drifting off to the ambience that was carrying through the microphones when this extremely high-pitched shriek pierced the airwaves. Immediately, I fumbled with my gear, snatching the headphones off as I felt my heart beat faster than it ever had before. I took a moment to recompose and then placed the headphones back on to listen. The noise was gone. But it did feel like there were reverberations from it everywhere in the audio. There was this low thrill that filled the void from the shriek. Hesitantly, I rewound the audio, turning the volume to a lower frequency so it wouldn't hurt my ears. Ordinarily, to get proper analysis, we are told to not do this. But the situation was unique, and I figured that it would be easier to handle the screams if they didn't terrify me. What I heard disturbed me beyond what mere words can describe. The best way to offer an explanation would be to provide you with an anecdote from my childhood. I had a dog named Brutus when I was little, a large Labrador retriever that could hold his ground against the toughest predators out there. One time, I swear, I saw him run off a bear. This dog was loyal. He would always go with us hunting and making sure that we were protected. It was like he had eyes in the back of his head. One particular hunt, my brother and I decided to go out when it was storming and try to find a few deer that enjoyed grazing after a soft rain. Yet the storm hadn't quite passed us yet, and I fell into this muddy ditch. Brutus came slipping and sliding right behind me. His leg got caught by this gnarly, thorny branch and he let out this yelp that pierced the rain. I got up and tried to help him, but it was like attempting to wrangle a fish as it flopped from the water. Brutus was confused, terrified, struggling so much that it was only making his pain worse with each passing moment. We couldn't seem to pull him free. I told my brother to go get our dad, try to find a rope, and we could perhaps snag the branch up and free Brutus. Meanwhile, he continued to whine and yelp, the thorns digging into his leg muscles the more he fought against the snare. Ain't no way to move that branch. It's too muddy. I don't have any good equipment, Dad told us when he assessed the situation. He told us to leave Brutus there, and he would figure it out. But he didn't. Instead... As my brother and I went home, I could hear my dog's shrieks echo across the night air. The sound of suffering. Endless pain. And, with each new yelp, it became worse. The sounds across the airwaves of Mars reminded me of my dog, and how he died that night caught in the mud. 
I was helpless to save him. As helpless as I was to find out the truth about these recordings. I pulled up the location data from the rover to give me an idea of where the shriek had come from. Near one of the many wide craters that we have been studying in search for Martian water, I realized. The data was still being transmitted and it told me that the final compiling would come in in the morning. It was difficult to wait, but I knew that there wouldn't be many more answers coming that night. Still intrigued by the noises I heard, I decided to pull audio files from the surrounding area for the past week and see if I could determine any clues. It resulted in a lack of sleep, and even less answers. As I pieced together the audio on my home desktop, I noticed that a pattern emerged. The screams were there, every so often amid the data. But they were moving. I pulled out a map of the Martian landscape and began to chart a course where I heard them. As the rover moved and surveyed the area, the noise would sound as though it was following the river. Was there a possibility something was alive on the Martian world and watching our rover? The painful and anguished screams haunted my dreams. It sounded worse and worse with each new recording I found. Hearing the silence and the low, thrumming soil of Mars in between the unexpected shrieks was a blessing. My tired brain told me there was more to it. But I had to sleep. And, of course, nightmares came when I did. I saw cities that didn't have shape. Metropolitan areas on Mars from ancient times. It reminded me of the old science fiction stories from the 20s. An entire civilization living under the ice. In the dream, something crashed on the surface of the planet. Something from a world unlike any we had ever encountered. The dream didn't offer it any shape or form. It was just this abomination of noise that was surrounding the entire landscape. The Martians ran and shrieked, the formless creatures mimicking their suffering and spreading its awful noise everywhere. The ground shook and swallowed them all up, leaving behind only vibrations. I woke the next day in a cold sweat. It felt like that same noise had permeated my skin. I wanted so desperately to find out what was happening on the red planet, so I got to work and immediately checked the other rovers to see if they picked up mysterious signals. I just wanted my dream to be nothing more than my fragile imagination. But, as I reviewed the traces of data we had collected... I saw disturbing evidence of something within the soil where the rover had surveyed. Microorganisms, bacterial life that can exist anywhere in the universe. It was migrating to the ground and following the rover. I began to check other data, photographs and videos from the area that had been downloaded and properly cleaned. Yet, I found nothing. No evidence of a life from near to the area, or at least, not one visible. As much as I hated to do it, I decided to present the data to my manager. I figured they could keep things under control and perhaps alleviate some of the worry I had. These screams were troubling me, making me lose sleep, and I wanted to find a scientific solution that wouldn't terrify me. She promised to review the data, but the next day when I asked about it, she acted like I had made the whole thing up. That has already been processed and cataloged. I want you to focus on the other findings from the crater, she insisted. When I returned to my research, though, I found copies of the audio files on my computer, which confirmed that I had truly heard these noises. So, why was she denying their existence? 
I tried to move them offline again to have someone outside of our facility review the data, but soon found that the information was now heavily secured. Someone didn't want this to get out, my close friend Stephen told me. I showed him the chart of the Martian landscape that I've been reviewing and he began to trace a pattern from where the different noises had come from. And each time you said that it's a high pitch noise, yeah? He asked. I nodded and he told me something that should have been plainly obvious. This thing... It's getting closer. And closer. Each time you record it, the pitch is decreasing. The wavelengths are traveling to you slower and slower as well. In other words... Something may have gone terribly wrong on the surface of Mars, and we don't even know about it yet. Do you believe it could be something dangerous? I asked. What are the samples shown? I reviewed them again. The sudden findings of life that I had recorded were now gone, erased completely. Rewinding that trace data showed a shocking result. When the noise came... The bacterial life forms would shrivel as a result. These screams were acting as a pestilence on the Martian world. The next nightmare I had was more vivid. The extraterrestrial parasite which had crashed on the planet was now infecting the ground. I saw a lush and vibrant Mars transform into the wasteland we knew so well. The civilization that named the planet home was killed in only a matter of weeks, and then the virus ate them alive, devouring every part of their body, and possibly even their souls. I saw the invisible effects of the screams on the planet everywhere I looked in my dream. Scars that ran deep into the red core revealed wounds of dead soil. Dangerous, invisible parasites that eagerly cling to any life that passes by. Suddenly, I felt my legs slipping into the crimson soil, being pulled under. Dragged down to this Martian hell, I found myself scraping and gasping for breath as dirt and soil was spilling into my throat. And I was drowning on this alien world. I woke up gasping and unable to breathe, and I ran to the bathroom and began to vomit. What came out of my lungs were particles of sand and red soil. I looked down at my body, astonished to find that I was covered in the color of Mars from head to toe. Swiftly, I bathed and shook away the nightmare disturbed by this sudden telepathic connection I had with the planet. Was it because of the infectious noise that I had heard? Was it trying to eat me alive the same way it had the old Martians? I tried again to tell my supervisors of the potential threat, but instead of listening, she informed me that I was going to be relocated to a different apartment. There was evidence that you attempted to retrieve secured audio files recently and share them, which goes against our policy. You are lucky to have a job at all, she told me. I was astounded at the sudden change in attitude, her behavior seemingly hostile when I brought up the recordings. I'll have the rest of the team review them, but I'm afraid I will have to ask you to clear out your desk and leave by the end of the day. I did as I was told, but not before I created a small backdoor program to get into their network. It didn't take long, and I was certain that monitoring the noises would be smart for the future. Once I finished, I left for lunch and started to download the files to my laptop. Stephen assisted me with it, but told me that most of the files now seemed corrupted. I think your bosses are doing this on purpose, he said. Yeah, I think it might be that this noise is affecting them subconsciously, I admitted, as I fidgeted nervously with my fork. I 
Have you tried to play the audio backwards? He asked casually. The thought hadn't even occurred to me. Are you saying it'll be like a secret code or something? I joked. No, but you know, it could reveal something about the samples we're missing, he told me. As we experimented with the corrupted audio again, I heard distortions and shrieks again, and he immediately became tense. Jesus. That's a nightmare, he whispered nervously. His hair was standing up on his arm as we kept listening, and I commented, It gets louder every time the rover is obtaining samples. So, the samples that are transmitting data here are transferring whatever this is to Earth? He asked. Neither of us knew what to make of that implication, but he requested to review the data and try to hack it that evening. So I let him. I called my boss that evening, begging her to listen to reason. Something about all of this was very, very wrong. You need to step out of the way of progress. These samples will show us how the entire planet of Mars has evolved into the Eden it is today. An Eden? <laughs> are we... are we talking about the same planet? I asked with a soft laugh, but she didn't appreciate the joke. Her tone was serious. What the planet is offering to our world is greater than anything you can imagine. Terraforming an entire world into a perfect environment. It would be a miracle for Earth, she whispered. I found myself suddenly uneasy talking to her. But the planet of Mars is dead. We've seen that it's deteriorating, perhaps even dying. How is that a blessing for us? The silence over the next few moments was ominous. Death is the only consistency in the universe. Life sprung from nothing eons ago. It is inevitable that one day it will all be snuffed out. Our time here is for one purpose alone. To serve as fuel for the next cycle. What? Um, what are you talking about? Then I heard this low thrill behind her as she kept speaking. It is our very existence that is the problem. Life is meant only to feed death. And death... Death is eternal. Perfect. Beautiful. Michelle... Do you hear that? I whispered becoming terrified by the conversation. She sounded possessed. It sounded like the winds of Mars were bristling through her lungs. It is the warning of the future we must prepare for. The inevitable transformation of our own world. My mouth felt dry. These samples that have been taken from the craters. What exactly happens to them? I asked. I think you know the answer to that. They come here. They will find their way to our world one way or another, she whispered. The noise in the background was making my ears feel like they were bleeding. Surrender to evolution... Death is the ultimate phase of all life. I hung up the phone and frantically called Stephen, hoping that he was available. Yet I got no answer. I grabbed my keys and decided to race to his house. These recordings were more than just a peculiarity. They were a threat to our world. I tried to knock on his door, but there was no response. 
I shouted for his attention, yet instead I heard that same shrill noise. It made me want to cover my ears and get into a fetal position. I pulled myself up and found a window I could crawl into. Inside his small one-bedroom house, the noise was deafening. My eardrums felt like they could burst as I stuffed wads of paper to soften the intense screams. Then, I found Stephen. Mutilated in his living room. It was clear the injuries were self-inflicted. They had taken one of his kitchen knives and sliced off his ears first, stuffing them into his mouth. Then, they had sliced his wrists and let the blood drain out on his couch. Finally, even as his life ebbed away, it appeared that he had carved open his stomach, letting his guts hang out and dangle on the carpet. Somehow, despite all of this madness, I saw that my friend had typed a message on his laptop. A warning. They are listening. I found myself wanting to pick up that same blade and harm myself. This invisible voice was urging me to kill, to let death take over my useless body. The blade touched my own neck, cutting into my flesh as I struggled to escape the screams. I managed to get out before I was overwhelmed by that desire. As I drove home, my boss called me again. I panicked and sent it to voicemail. When I later checked the recording, all I heard was the same howling. Slow, methodical, shrill noises. That told me the strange, invisible threat I had heard was now here. I made it home, hardly able to think straight or even focus. Then, I managed to compose this warning for others. I have realized that the concerns Stephen had were even more serious than we first understood. The dangerous, invisible evil is already on its way here. And worst of all, it may already be too late to stop it. Boy, can't you just take one day and shut them damn books? Papa said sternly. I closed the small dictionary I had with me and placed it back in my bag. Papa always said, We ain't the learning kind of folk, boy. You best remember that. I hated him for that. He always said this when I wanted to try and learn something new. Reading that small dictionary was my only way to learn new words and expand my vocabulary. However, that was almost a lifetime ago. I'm 35 now with a child of my own. Papa is in a nursing home in New Orleans, living out his twilight years. And here I am on the old family homestead, leading pretty much the same life that Papa showed me. Now, growing up in the dead center of the bayou in southern Louisiana, I always had the propensity to learn new things, because let's face it, there's not much to do in the swampland other than catching crawfish and dodging gators all day long. I'd sit up in our rickety dock and toss an old small crawfish cage in the water with bits of rotten chicken in it. 
I usually produced about ten to fifteen big ones every time I had let the cage sit long enough on the bottom, if they were in season. As far back as I can remember, it was just me and Papa. And Papa always told me, Boy, if you ain't got smarts, this swamp will get you. But that's why you got the bayou running through them veins. Now, my papa, he was not book smart since he only finished second grade and had to drop out due to his own daddy running off and leaving his mama in a lurch. He had to do what was best for his mama and little brother, even if all he did was help clean the floors and go fishing every night. Papa had to keep some type of food on the table for his tiny family to survive. I was about nine years old when he told me that story probably because he didn't want me to do the same thing to a lady that I got along with real well. You know, preparing me for the future and whatnot. But I never saw it that way at the time. Papa was a proud man, always provided for him and I, for the most part. Papa had a hard time with the devil's nectar. Alcohol, to be more specific. He had a tendency to overindulge quite often. But that's beside the point. Papa did well with keeping the household afloat. Always had a decent supper and a warm fire going on those cooler nights. That didn't last long, though. We started struggling when I was about 11. Boy, don't you dilly-dally on them cages, Papa said as I bowed my head in obedience. I pulled the first cage up on the dock and it had about seven or eight crawfish in the bottom. I showed Papa, and he looked at the cage in disgust. Damn, only seven, Papa said. Sorry, Papa, maybe not enough bait, I replied. Well, son, it don't matter. Couple more cages and we should be all right for a couple suppers. Yeah, we'll make us a stew. I sat there staring at the cage with seven measly crawfish and noticed one of them had a whole bunch of eggs underneath of it. Papa? Yeah, son. Why is there a bunch of eggs on this one? Well, usually that means that the mama, Papa replied. Mama? Hey, Papa, why don't I got a mama? I cautiously asked. Papa's face paled a bit, and I could tell that there was a semblance of hesitancy before he spoke. Well, boy, there ain't much to tell you. No need to sugarcoat it, neither. Your mama died a long time ago. She was out fooling around in the garden. Come the next morning, I found her laying in that garden. She wasn't breathing, had no heartbeat neither. I tried and tried to get her to come back, but I just couldn't. Now there weren't no doctors anywhere around this area. So I took your mama way out in the bayou and buried her underneath the old twisted tree, Papa explained. This news was a relative shock to me. I never even knew that I had a mama, let alone knowing that she died right here in our garden. I was staring at the garden for what must have been several seconds before I said anything. Papa continued talking. Well, you see, boy, you wasn't more than a year old when this happened, so I just started raising you on my own. Then about three years later, you was out on the front porch and I heard you start yelling. I came a-running again from the kitchen, and you were sitting cross-legged, pointing into the swamp there. You said you was a-seeing some type of fire or something over beyond the cypress trees. So I grabbed you up and took you inside with me to finish your supper. Uh, you scared me so much that I'd never leave you out of my sight. So that's why you can't never go out there without me. I started thinking about what my papa was saying, and I realized that there wasn't so much of a single picture of my mama anywhere in the house. Papa? Yeah, boy. What did mama look like? Papa sat and thought for a moment before reaching into his pocket, retrieving a small swatch of cloth. Papa stared at it for a moment, and then he unraveled the fabric. There in the fabric was a small silver locket. He opened it and handed the locket to me. I stood there examining the small picture. Mama was a very pretty lady. Long black hair and what looked like a rather expensive hair clip in. Slender with a pale complexion. 
Mama had deep, piercing brown eyes that seemed like they were looking at you any which way you moved the picture. Your mama was the prettiest girl in town. We had met a long time ago when I was working on a daddy's farm. We used to just sit and talk during my short breaks, and she'd bring me ice-cold sweet tea. Yeah. Eventually, she ended up telling me that she had had enough of her daddy's rich living and wanted to live among us common folk. <laughs> I never knowed exactly what she would want to do there, but we made some arrangements, and she come down here and stayed a while. We got along real well, and then we ended up getting married. Your mama daddy didn't like me too much on account for stealing his daughter away from him, so he decided that he wasn't going to talk to her no more. Papa took the locket back from me and placed it back in the swash of cloth. I noticed before he wrapped it up, there was a strange symbol on the front of the locket. It looked like a star with a circle around it. Papa, what does that star mean? Uh, well, son, uh, your mama had a few different views on things. She believed in a god and a goddess. She would always put this star on everything. Some about the elements or whatever. She would go outside in the nighttime, light some candles, and then sit there for a while. Hell, I even seen her sometimes drinking the swamp water. I had asked her about drinking that nasty water once, and she told me this. The swamp water is for protection. It'll carry me through anything. Makes me feel stronger. Now, since I don't really believe in those sort of things, I kind of let her do her own thing. It was a bit above my learning, Papa said. Papa started to stand up on the dock. Uh, well, I reckon this will have to do for today. Best be heading inside before it gets too dark, Papa said as he took a drink from his hip flask. Okay, Papa. I replied, following him inside for the night. The evening went on as usual. We steamed up some crawfish and rice, and then Papa made a nice gravy. He called it the poor man's crawfish etouffee. Wasn't much, but it's what we had. Later on in the night, Papa switched on the radio and listened to his favorite station while sipping on his glass pint of whiskey. He would drink on that whiskey until it was gone, smoking at least ten or so cigarettes before he finished his bottle. Sometimes he would just sleep in his chair until the next morning. It wasn't long after 11 o'clock that Papa had been passed out in his chair. His snoring sounded like a jackhammer. I slowly stood up from the old couch we had and decided to step out on the porch. Opening the screen door slowly, that way the creaking of the door wouldn't wake Papa. It was hot even in the night time. Muggy as all get out but nonetheless felt good to get some fresh air away from that musty old house full of cigarette smoke. Walking out to the edge of the porch, I could look down and see the small frogs and tadpoles swimming around the swamp. If it weren't for all the mosquitoes in the area, then this would be a mighty fine place to relax at night. I took a seat cross leg on the porch, staring down at the swamp and getting lost in thought. I thought about my mother and how Papa had told me he had found her in the garden up beside the house. I looked at the garden and then back at the murky water. I couldn't see much further into the swamp because we only had the one porch light and it didn't reach far into the darkness of night. I leaned up against one of the posts on the porch and looked straight out into the abyss of the swamps. Just then... I saw a small reddish-yellow light far off into the distance. It had looked to me like it was a small ball of fire just dancing around in the woods. Perplexed, I stood back up and tried to squint my eyes to see better. Not one, not two, but now three balls of light started circling around one another. I was amazed at what I was seeing. I began to move down to the edge of the porch closest to the phenomena I was witnessing. The sudden noise startled me as I realized that I had accidentally knocked one of our old crawfish cages into the swamp 
and it wasn't tied off. I had a sinking feeling in my guts because I knew Papa was going to be mad. Boy, what you doing? Get your ass in here now! Papa yelled as he was opening the screen door. Sorry, Papa. I just wanted a little fresh air and I, I accidentally knocked one of the cages into the water. I said timidly. What the hell I tell you about being out here by yourself? I done told you that you ain't supposed to be out here by yourself. Now you done lost one of the cages, and you ain't a care in the world. What you doing out here anyways? Like I said, Papa, I just wanted a little fresh air and come out here to breathe a little, but then... I trailed off, looking in the direction of the now undetectable fiery balls. What, boy? Papa said, with a hefty edge of aggravation in his voice. I thought I saw some lights down in the far end of the swamp there. Just lighting up and bouncing around, I replied. Papa looked at me with angry eyes and said with a low and slow tone, Get in the house, now. I walked in the house as Papa held the door and let it slam behind me, startling me slightly as I turned and sat on the old musty couch. Papa, I'm so- Shut up, boy. I done told you not to be wandering around out of my sight. Papa interrupted with a snarl. I, I know, Papa. I won't do it again, I promise. I, I was just getting some air and then I saw those light things and I just wanted to see what they were. Papa sat back down in his armchair and sighed. <sighs> Boy, you ever heard of the Le Foufoule? No, sir, I haven't. Hmm, well, let me tell you something. Le Foufoule is something your mama talk about all the time. Some about fairies. Some say that it's your loved ones coming back and checking on you after they long dead. Yeah, boy. But most folks around here say it's the evil spirits trying to lure you into a trap and kill you. Your mama was obsessed with them and left little things outside in the garden, gifts she called them. Now I wasn't so sure that your mama hadn't gone off her rocker, but I loved her just the same. So I let her do the things she wanted and I kept to myself. Hmm. But she was always writing funny symbols all over stuff, like squiggly lines and small pictures. Mm -hmm. Always telling me the fairies be good to her if she leaves them things, like feathers or some type of shiny stuff. She would leave them gifts in the garden, and the next day, they be gone. The fairies, Papa? I asked. Yeah, I know how it sounds. She believed in them things. Your mama started doing this stuff every day, and she got quieter and quieter as time went on, till she had you. She kept giving thanks to them fairies, hoping it would bring you safety. She kept fussing with you and them fairies so much that I didn't get to spend time with your mama. Huh. And that kept on for about a year or so. Papa's eyes started to well up, and this thousand-yard stare got even deeper. Yeah, your mama depended so much on them fairies. And I remember one night, you was fussing so much that she forgot to lay out a gift for the fairies. We all went to bed after she laid you down and fell asleep. She shot straight up in the middle of the night and jumped out of bed and started rustling around. Are you gonna wake the baby? I told her. I forgot the gift. Oh my God, I forgot the gift. Your mama said, Don't be silly, Abby. They ain't gonna be mad about it. Just come back to bed. Your mama kept messing around in the house. And then she turned to me and said, Don't worry. I'll fix it real quick. And then I'll be back to bed. Okay, Abby. You do what you gotta do. I told her. Well, I soon fell back asleep waiting on her to come back to bed. And I slept like a log. Next thing I knew, I was waking up on account of your cry. I look over, and your mama wasn't in bed. So I just figured she was already up and on her way to get you out your crib. I stood up and got my clothes on and walked out into the kitchen. You were still crying. So I went into your room 
and there you were, just laying there squirming around. I picked you up and started hollering for your mama. Abby! Abigail! Where you gone to? I didn't hear nothing, so I started walking around the house looking for her. I looked everywhere. I finally figured that maybe she went off to the market to get a few things. So I got you all cleaned up and fed you your oats. Once I had you nestled back in for your nap, I started prepping the crawfish cages for the day. I walked around to the side of the house to grab them cages. That when I saw your mama, laying there in the garden face down. Looked like she had tiny scratch marks all over her. I ran over to her and started shaking her a bit to see if she just fell asleep in that garden. She wasn't moving. I leaned over and felt her face and it was ice cold. Her eyes was open and kind of grayed over. That's when I noticed she wasn't breathing. I tried and tried to bring her back, but it'd been too long. Since there wasn't no doctor folk around, I done buried her under the oldest cypress tree in the swampland. That's why there's a wooden cross in front of that tree. <laughs> Papa sniffled, and then all of a sudden his eyes shifted towards the window. Slowly he stood up and walked toward the four running panes of glass. <laughs> what in God's name? Papa said in a puzzled tone. I stood up and crept closer to the window to get a look at what Papa was staring at. There in the distance, a ball of light a bit bigger than the ones I had seen before. Papa, it's the light. I told you I wasn't fooling you, I said. Go to your room now, Papa yelled. I didn't wait around for Papa to tell me twice. I ran to my room and shut the door. I could hear Papa shuffling things around in the living room, then heard some loud banging noises. I slowly inched my door open just a sliver so I could see what he was doing. Papa was taking old boards and nailing up the windows. I could hear him muttering something under his breath. Damn this swamp. Damn it straight to hell. I didn't want to get caught watching, so I shut my door and just listened to Papa nail them boards to the windows. He didn't stop until all the windows that he could see were covered. However... In his haste of hanging all those boards, he quickly winded himself, and I heard him plop back down into his chair, and heard the pop of the cork from his whiskey bottle, followed by the lighting of a cigarette. He drained whatever was left in his bottle, and then there was just the sound of the crickets in his radio. Soon after Papa settled back down, I noticed a slight glimmer of light emanating from my window on the opposite side of the room. He forgot my window. I whispered. I stood up and walked to my window, where a small ball of light was hovering about twenty or so feet away and about three or four feet off the ground. The very instant that I laid eyes on the mysterious ball of fire, it started moving towards my window ever so slowly. Once the ball had arrived about five feet from my window, I felt like I heard some faint noise like an ethereal voice talking softly. I closed my eyes as the words became more and more discernible. Those were the words that were spoken. Now I don't know what it meant at the time, but as soon as those words became clear, the ball slowly faded back out of view and into the darkness of the swamp. I stepped away from the window and sat on my bed. I rifled around in my small desk drawer and retrieved the pencil and a piece of scrap paper and wrote down the words that I had heard. Well, I folded the piece of paper and stuck it inside an old dictionary I had tucked into my desk. I walked back over to the door and opened it slightly. All the windows in the living area and kitchen were poorly boarded up and Papa was once again snoring in drunken bliss in his chair. I closed the door and laid myself down on my bed, thinking about that ball of fire. Before I knew it, I had drifted off to sleep. Boy, 
Better get up. Ain't no sense of sleeping the day away, Papa roared. Slowly, I wiped the sleep from my eyes, and Papa came into focus in the middle of the room. It took me a few seconds to register that he was holding something. Looked like a small box. What you got there, Papa? I asked drowsily. Well, this is really all I got left of your mama. I figured that you'd like to see the rest. Climbing out of bed, I took a few short steps towards the small box Papa had in his hands. It was a dark wooden box, but it had sayings and that star again all over it. Papa handed me the box and I lifted the lid open. Inside there was a small black and worn leather bound journal, three small corked glass vials, two with some type of liquid in it and the third looked like wings from a big bug. There was a lock of black hair tied with a ribbon and what appeared to be alligator teeth and old metal beer tabs strewn about the bottom. On the inside of the lid was an older black and white picture of Mama and Papa together, younger though, and seemed quite happy. What is all this? I asked. This was the last of your Mama's things. She carried this everywhere. When she went into town, this was with her. When she went out to the garden, so did the box, so on and so forth. It was my figuring that you maybe wanted these things here so you could be a little closer to your mama. Thanks, Papa. Papa turned around and walked out of my room, and there I stood with all that remained of my mama. Several minutes passed as I just stood there in the center of my room staring at the contents of the box. I removed the small journal and set the box down on my desk. Opening the journal, I saw my mama's writing for the first time. The first entry written was dated Friday, June 18, 1954. Here's what it said. It's humid out this morning. The paper said it's going to reach up to 98 degrees. I'm six months pregnant today, and I'm really starting to feel like I can't do much for Sam. I feel like I'm getting weaker and weaker by the day but I can't let it slow me down. I walked out further into the swamp today, trying to explore a little further out. I saw this old cypress tree with real long gnarly limbs. It almost felt like the tree and I had a sort of connection. When I touched the tree, it almost seemed to breathe. Now, I know that's nonsense. Trees don't have lungs and they certainly can't breathe, but I felt it. Well, that's enough for today, I suppose. I gotta get going before Sam gets home with his haul today. If it's a good haul, then we'll have our work cut out for us. Until next time, Abby. I stopped reading and looked away from the journal and up at my bedroom door. Papa was standing in the door frame and staring at me with his arms crossed. You about ready to hit the water? Yes, Papa. Placing the journal back into the box and closing the lid, I proceeded to pull on my boots and grab my hat. Walking out of the house, it was awfully hot and humid and reminded me of the journal entry that Mama had written. Papa started rigging the aluminum boat and loading it up with the trap hooks and ice boxes for the crawfish. Best be getting on, boy. If the market ain't got no crawfish by opening time, then we gonna be out of a job, Papa urged. Yes, sir. Papa climbed into the boat first and held it steady against the dock, allowing me to get a good footing while boarding the boat. I sat at the bow of the boat and Papa was at the stern in control of the small outboard Johnson motor. The cages we had deployed were about a mile or so down the river, so there was a fair amount of time just sitting and talking. Papa, have you read Mama's journal? Papa just kept staring ahead, directing the boat, and his face dropped a little almost like he was disappointed. I done told you, boy. I really ain't the learning type. Never did get a good hold on that reading stuff. Your mama was a rightly smart lady. She knew how to read and write. Yeah, but my mama and pa never did learn how to do either, so I never did get much learning, Papa explained. Oh, so Papa, can't you read? I've seen you sign your name on the papers at the market. So you know how to write? <laughs> Boy, 
That's only because your mama taught me how to write my name. But that's all I know. Your mama made sure you had all them books in there. That way you could learn how. Your mama always told me that she wanted you to have a good education. You know, book smarts. That's why your mama's friend at the schoolhouse will come out on the days of the week to help you learn, Papa further explained. Well, do you want to know what's in the journal? Boy, it's been about ten years since that book been in that box. I ever known this whole time, and I ain't itching now. Enough about all this stuff. We got work to do. Before I knew it, we were approaching the first cage buoy. Get that hook, boy. Pull up that cage, Papa demanded. Yes, Papa. I said as I reached for the hook. I leaned over the side of the small aluminum boat and hooked onto the metal ring attached to the top of the buoy, hoisting it into the boat. I then pulled on the rope until I felt the weight of the cage itself lift off the bottom of the swamp. Slowly it came to the surface. I reached out to grab the top of the cage when I noticed something in the water. Right there in front of my face was a reflection that did not belong to my own face. No, this was something that I couldn't quite make out at the first glance. The water became steady as I stopped moving the cage around and the reflection became clearer. This was the face of a woman. Long black hair, pale face, and eyes that were darker than the bottom of the swamp at midnight. Boy, what you doing? Papa yelled, breaking me out of my trance. Sorry, Papa. I, I thought I saw a gator and needed to make sure. I responded, trying to make something up quickly so I didn't have to tell Papa the truth. If you done saw a gator, get the gun, Papa replied. Well, I thought it was a gator at first, Papa, but I think it was just a big fish. Sorry, Papa, I said, hoping he would believe me. Well, okay, but them crawfish ain't gonna haul themselves up out of there. Get back to it, boy. The very instance that Papa had startled me out of my trance, I realized that I had dropped the cage back down into the swamp. So quickly, I pulled the cage back up carefully, trying to avoid staring into the water for too long. This cage was almost full. There had to be at least 100 to 125 decently sized crawfish in there. Yeah! Boy, now that's a crawfish haul. Gonna be doing good today, boy. Ha <laughs> ha! I feel like it's gonna be a real good day. Yeah! Papa was right. That was just the first cage. We ended up having the same luck at our last seven cages, all of them plumb full of crawfish. We headed off a little further down river towards the market. When we arrived, Papa walked into the market up on the bank and asked if he could get some help unloading today's haul. Papa came back to the boat with another man about 20 years younger than him. The other man, Papa and I, carried our fair share of the load up into the market. I watched as Papa and the market owner dumped all the crawfish onto a giant table filled with ice. After that was completed, the market owner handed Papa a piece of paper and Papa signed his name. The deal was that for every pound of crawfish Papa brought in, he would get a dollar. That day we made $135. Papa was as happy as a pig in mud. The other part of the bargain was that Papa could take home four pounds of crawfish. So we took our four pounds and shopped around the market for potatoes, onion, corn, carrots, celery, and various seasonings. Papa even bought some shrimp. We were going to have ourselves a crawfish boil tonight. After purchasing the items previously mentioned, Papa also bought himself his usual pint of whiskey. We loaded up our boat and headed back for home. The trip back home was a good one for Papa. He was happy about how the day had turned out. And honestly, so was I. However, I was pretty silent most of the time because I couldn't get that reflection I saw out of my mind. You all right, boy? Papa asked as we were pulling up to our rickety old dock. Yeah, Papa. Just a little tired. It's awful hot today. I replied, not revealing the whole truth. Well, I got you something when you wasn't looking, Papa said as he produced a bottle of ice-cold Coca-Cola out from underneath the ice where the crawfish and shrimp sat. I was elated. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Papa. I exclaimed while quickly standing up and giving him a hug. I almost tipped the boat over in my excitement. Ha <laughs> ha, you're welcome, boy. You enjoyed that. 
Not every day you get one of them, Papa replied. Papa was right. I maybe received one of these once every six months, so this was truly a treat. I decided to put the Coke in the icebox until Papa had made our supper. Boy, it was a feast. The aroma of the boil was welcomed, filling the house with hints of pepper and seafood, as opposed to the smell of musty air and stale cigarette smoke. Papa emptied out the boiling pot into a strainer and dumped the contents over a newspaper-covered table. I retrieved my Coke out the icebox, and we both dug into that glorious meal. Mmm. Well, boy, hmm. That was one of the best suppers we've had in a while. <laughs> Why don't you go and get them cages out the boat and put them up for the night? Yes, Papa. I replied, savoring the last sips of the sugary soft drink, knowing that it was going to be quite a while before I'd have another one. I stood up, excusing myself from the table, and headed outside to the dock to gather the cages. Stepping outside, I noticed that it felt considerably cooler due to the fact that the sun had finally set and its rays were no longer a burden on my skin. Walking over to the boat and retrieving the cages, I set them up on the side of the dock so as they were ready for tomorrow's deployment. I turned around and looked over at the doorway, and there stood Papa, watching as he always was. I turned back towards the swamp and glanced at the large cypress tree looming over most of the trees in the surrounding area. I felt a small tinge of remorse as I stared at the tree for a moment. So I turned back towards the house and walked back inside. Papa closed and latched the screen door behind me, turned on the radio and proceeded to settle into his armchair with his new pint of whiskey. The song Louisiana Mama sang by Gene Pitney emanated from the speakers of Papa's old cathedral-style radio. He sat there tapping his fingers to the rhythm of the song, taking a fresh swig from his bottle. I walked into my room and turned the lamp on. Closing my door behind me, I walked over to the box on my desk, retrieving the journal and opening it to the second entry. Monday, June 21st, 1954. This last weekend was quite eventful. I didn't get a chance to ride in here because we had so much going on. Sam was busy building a cradle for the baby, and I spent my time out in the garden preparing the various vegetables for an early harvest. I was also thinking about performing a ritual that could potentially reveal whether the baby was going to be a boy or a girl. I'm not too sure about how Sam would feel about that, given the fact that he doesn't believe in the craft. I'll see how receptive he is when I ask. I know here in a few months we are going to be harvesting in September for our winter storage. A lot of canning to be done. Sam is going to try to get some wild game so we can cook it up and can it, or freeze. The baby is starting to kick real hard. I'm going to wrap this up. I'm hoping Sam and I can settle on a baby name soon. I was thinking Virginia if it's a girl and Calvin if it's a boy. I hope Sam is open to those names. Until next time, Abby. I closed the journal and laid down in my bed just thinking about what Mama had written. Papa had always stocked up our freezer and pantries with food enough to last us the winter. Plenty of fish and gator. Sometimes Papa would get him a whole deer and that would be enough for the two of us. I laid there thinking about Mama's words. And then came the visage of that reflection I saw in the water. I realized fairly quickly that the reflection had a striking resemblance to the picture of Mama in Papa's locket. I stood up and walked over to my desk and opened the drawer that held several books. I selected the modern dictionary and a Creole translation book. I opened the dictionary to the piece of paper upon which I had written the saying, Fais confiance non marécage la. I started looking in the Creole translation book and slowly started to piece the saying together in modern English. Trust in the swamp. That is what the words translated to. I quickly grabbed the journal and flipped to the third entry. Friday, June 25th, 1954. It's been about a week since I've been able to write. Sam has finished the cradle and I myself had done some collecting. I've collected some swamp water and two small vials, fairy wings, alligator teeth, 
and placed a lock of my own hair tied with the ribbon with these other items. This is meant to be a safety talisman. All of these things together provide protection. I will carry these wherever I may go to keep Sam, the baby, and myself safe from the darkness of the swamp. Darkness of the swamp? I asked myself. I continued reading the entry. The swamp has recently been very unforgiven. Sam hasn't had much of a haul this week, and at night I swear I keep seeing things deeper in the swampland. Small flickers of light. I'm not too sure what they may mean, but it reminds me of a story that my grandfather used to tell me about Les Le Follet, swamp fairies. The story goes that they are the loved ones once passed on, checking on other living family members. However, there's another story that says they're evil entities trying to lure you into a trap. Once you are caught, they take you. Maybe I'm going crazy, but I know what I saw. I think maybe just to be safe, I'll start leaving small tokens of appreciation to these possible beings. Maybe it could help. Until next time, Abby. I closed the journal. Fairies? Seriously? I asked myself. I placed the journal back into the box and closed the lid. Turning around, I started walking towards my window, looking out into the ever-darkening swampland. It only took a few moments and then I saw them. Several burning dots of light appeared near the big twisty cypress tree. I finally decided that enough was enough. I was going to find out what those lights were once and for all. I slowly opened my door and found Papa snoring loudly in his armchair. Grabbing Mama's box, I started my way through the house. I'm going to have to be extra careful if I'm going to get by Papa, I thought. I opened my door and started carefully making my way past Papa and through the front screen door. The door shut behind me, barely making a noise. I looked back through the door, making sure that Papa was still asleep. He was, holding his mostly empty pint of whiskey in his hand. I moved further down the porch and onto the dock. I stepped into the small aluminum boat very carefully as not to rustle the water any more than needed. Untying the mooring ropes, I grabbed the old wooden oar tucked underneath the seats. I used the oar to softly push the boat away from the dock. Making my way around the house quietly, I managed to maneuver the craft through the narrow passages that directed me towards the inner swampland. I remember it being very quiet out, no crickets chirping, just the sound of the water cascading over the oar as it ebbed through the water. Still able to make out the small balls of light, I directed the boat towards them. Closer and closer I approached, the lights never moved hovering exactly where they had been. Soon, the crude cross that Papa had placed under that cypress tree came into view. The balls of light were getting bigger as I approached. I could make out some more details on these illuminated balls and noticed they were almost alternating. As I drew in close, I could make out small creatures in the center of these balls. Fluttering wings seemed to cause the light to generate. They looked like oversized dragonflies. I got about ten feet away, and the three balls of light stayed perfectly still, hovering in place. Les Foufoulets! The fairies! I exclaimed. Then suddenly the fairies shot straight in my direction. They stopped inches from my face. I could see now they were ugly brownish creatures with dragonfly wings. Their eyes were beady and completely black. My attention, however, was focused on what looked like razor-sharp talons on their hands and feet. One of the fairies buzzed a little closer to my face, as if it were studying me. The creature then made a horrendous squalling sound. Sounded kind of like a pig squealing after it had gotten injured. The swampland's darkness then illuminated in a great yellow-red light as hundreds of other fairies lit up surrounding me. The fairies' buzzing noises reached an incredible volume as they encroached on my location. The box, I whispered. I turned and quickly removed the box from under the seat. As soon as the fairies saw my movement, they moved in quickly as if they were about to attack. 
quickly. I positioned the box in front of me and immediately the fairy froze in place. Several of the creatures were inches from me, enveloping me in a whirlwind of light so bright that I'm sure you could see it from a mile away. I heard a loud noise off in the distance. Boy! Boy! Calvin! Where you done gone to? I heard Papa yell from the house. I looked back and saw Papa standing on the back porch waving a lantern around yelling for me. I could tell he was worried because he never used my real name, always calling me boy. Papa seemed to immediately draw in on my location due to the light given off by the fairies. Don't worry, boy, I'm coming! Papa yelled frantically. He started tromping through the swamp without a care in the world, heading in my direction. All of the commotion had effectively gotten the fairies' attention, and just as if they were one whole being, all of the fairies rose up into the air about five feet or so. Then all of them darted for Papa. No, wait! I yelled at the creatures. I saw them quickly advancing on Papa. I realized that the old Johnson outboard motor was still on the boat, so I quickly pulled the start string and the engine whirred to life. Setting the throttle to full, I quickly turned the boat around and headed towards Papa. By the time I had gotten about halfway to him, the creatures had engulfed him. I heard terrifying screams of pain coming from Papa as I made my way closer. I opened the box and threw several metal beer tabs at the fairies, causing them to stop their ferocious attack. The creatures collected the beer tabs and had left my papa alone. I quickly grabbed papa's arm and we both struggled to get him inside the boat. Papa looked real bad. Both of his eyes were bleeding and there were gashes and cuts all over him, more than I cared to count. Papa was breathing pretty heavy and he appeared to be extremely weak. I had decided that instead of taking Papa into the house, I would take us to the small town and see if there was a doctor anywhere nearby. It took us about 25 minutes to get to the small town, and as luck would have it, the market owner was still there at the store. Help! Somebody please help! I yelled, trying to get the small boat to the dock on the shore. The market owner heard me and ran out to see what was happening. My lord! What you got going on here, son? The market owner exclaimed. My papa, please help. He got hurt real bad. Please help me, sir. I replied. Come on, son. Let me help you get this boat tied off and get him up off the water. Yeah, ain't no need to call me sir now, either. The name's Ulysses. Yeah, we're gonna get him up on the shore here, and I'll run to the doctor's house to see if he's home. We pulled Papa out of the boat and laid him on the dock. Now, you wait here with your pa, and I'll be back as quick as I can, Ulysses said. Ulysses ran off into the darkness and I was left on that dock with Papa. Sitting there silently and noticing that Papa was now unconscious, most likely due to blood loss and pain, I started looking out into the swamp and I noticed three fairy lights hovering on the other side of the river. I focused my attention on them and then the light became significantly brighter on the immediate surroundings in their vicinity. I saw a figure slowly rise from the swamp. The figure was slender and about five feet tall, it seemed. Then my blood froze. The figure started walking on top of the water towards me. I was able to overcome the frozen fear by slowly backing away. Creeping backwards, the figure grew closer and closer. I was so overcome by fear that I tripped over my papa, falling onto him and quickly picking myself up. The time that it took to fall and pick myself up, the figure was now at the end of the dock. It seemed to stop as if some invisible force field was prohibiting it from moving any closer. Calvin. I heard in an ethereal voice. In fact, the same voice that I had heard in my bedroom when I saw the lights. Frightened, I started to speak. What? What is it? What do you want from me? Calvin, say confiona marekela. The figure said. Trust in the swamp. I whispered. Yes, Calvin, yes, that is correct. My, oh my, how you've grown. I am so proud of you. The figure that claimed to be Mama said. I broke my trance and took one step forward. 
I could see the details start to form in her face. She looked exactly like the picture in the locket that my papa had showed me. I took two more steps towards her. Calvin, I miss you so much. I'm sure that by now you've found that the fairies like gifts. Your papa never really understood this much. I gave them gifts to keep us all safe from evil spirits. That's why the fairies attacked him. He had never given a gift. Your papa had built that house upon some of those creatures' most sacred land. Up until I came along, he didn't have much luck in his ventures. When I started paying homage to the creatures, then fortune was in our favor. You, though, you were smart enough to throw those tabs for the fairies. They accepted them as several gifts. Please, Calvin, whatever you may do in life, trust in the swamp, Mama said. Mama seemed to slowly recede into the darkness as the light from the fairies dwindled down so completely that they were gone. Mama, wait, Mama, please. What all this hollering? <laughs> Papa, I yelled, running back to him. Papa was barely conscious, and his breathing was ragged. Papa, I saw Mama. She came to me and explained all about the fairies. I exclaimed. <laughs> What? <laughs> Where are they? I can't see nothing. <laughs> no, Papa, they aren't here anymore. They left. I said, while getting a better look at Papa's eyes. They were so severely cut that it looked just like dark red circles where his eyes should have been. I had never seen anything so gruesome in my life. About ten minutes later, Ulysses came running back up the dock with another man. Son, this is the doctor. He gonna see if he can help your pa, Ulysses said. My name is Dr. Hammond. What in the name of God has happened here, son? The doctor asked. Well, my papa and I were out in the swamp and he fell out of the boat. He started screaming a whole bunch and I could barely help him get into the boat. Maybe a couple of gators? I said. I had to make something up because if I had told them the truth, they may have put me in the crazy house. Well, I ain't never seen a gator attack like this. We better make arrangements to get him to the clinic, said the doctor. Ulysses left to round up a few other men around town and brought a stretcher with them. They loaded Papa onto the stretcher and carried him to the small clinic in the middle of town. I followed them and waited patiently in the waiting room for any news. A few hours later, the doctor approached me. Son, your Papa is in a very bad way right now. He will recover, but it will be quite some time. See, your papa was rendered blind by this attack, and we need to monitor him for a couple of weeks to make sure there ain't no bad infections getting away. What am I going to do? I asked. Your mama ain't at home? No, sir. I ain't got a mama. Well, then, I'll call over to the children's home and see if they have any room for you there for the next couple of weeks. Yes, sir. The doctor walked away and left me once again in the waiting room. I sat there and recounted the events that had just taken place just hours ago and wished that I could go back in time and stop it before it began. That was not the reality of this situation, though. What happened has happened, and there's nothing that can be done to undo the horrible event. The doctor came back a few minutes later and explained to me that I was going to be staying at the local children's home until my papa was fit to leave the hospital. He told me that some lady named Melinda was going to swing by shortly to pick me up and escort me to my home to gather some clothes and personal effects. Just as the doctor said, an hour later, Melinda arrived to escort me to my home and gather my things. I walked back down to the dock, noticing that my papa's blood was still splotched over the grayed planks of wood. We climbed into the boat and set off. The dawn was approaching, filling the sky with beautiful shades of pinks, purples, yellows, and orange. It reminded me of the fairy's glow. We arrived shortly at our small home, and I noticed a slight expression of distaste on Melinda's face. You live here? Yes, ma'am. We approached a small rickety dock and climbed out of the boat. I walked inside and Melinda followed me. 
I gathered my clothes and placed them in an old burlap sack that held the potatoes Papa had purchased from the market. I grabbed my dictionary and some paper and a pencil. Okay, ma'am. I've got everything I need. Are you sure? Yes, ma'am. Okay, then I guess we're off. We walked back outside and climbed back into the boat and headed off into the sunrise back toward town. The journey took about 25 minutes and we were back at the dock behind the market. Melinda climbed out of the boat first. As I stood to exit the boat, I stopped. I reached under the boat's seat and retrieved my mama's box and slipped it into my burlap sack. I stayed in that children's home for about a month when I had received word that my papa had definitely been rendered blind and crippled due to his injuries and could not be a proper caretaker for me. The state would continue care for my papa since he had become disabled. At least I knew he was in a good place to where I didn't have to worry about him. So at the children's home I stayed until I was 18 years old. At 18, I found myself a job at the very same market that Ulysses owned. I worked hard for several years and saved a few bucks. I was able to return to my old house out there on the bayou, and it really hadn't changed much except for a few more rotten planks on the dock and some leaks that had developed in the roof. It only took me a couple of months to whip the house back into shape and become livable again. It wasn't too long after that, one day while loading turnips into a market display, I laid my eyes on the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. Her name was Lila. I somehow conjured the courage to speak to her, and from that point on, we were two peas in a pod. A few years later, we had a beautiful baby girl, and we named her Abigail in honor of my mother. We had the best life I could ever ask for. I had a good job. Finally moving on from the market, I had enrolled in a trade school and became an electrician. About ten years went by slowly fixing up this old house. It finally became our dream home. One night though, when I was arriving home after a late night at work, I saw something that sent jolts of fear into my body. There by the old giant cypress tree. A solo fiery ball of light hovered just feet off the swamp's surface. I stood there in shock, and no sooner than it had appeared, it was gone. Once I had my breathing and nerves under control, I grabbed my tool pouch and walked into my home. My wife was reading a book on the couch. She looked up and smiled at me. Hey there, honey. How was work? Her voice was like some of the sweetest honey that was ever created. Oh, you know, just another day, darling, I replied as I leaned over and gave her a kiss. Is Abby asleep? I asked. She went back to her room a little while ago. She may still be awake, but she's had a long day, Lila said. Okay, darling, I said. I walked over to my daughter's bedroom door, which used to be my old childhood bedroom. I noticed a faint flickering light emanating from the crack under her door. Honey, I asked my wife. Yeah? She asked in return. Does Abby have any candles in her room? Not that I know of. Why? Lila retorted. Right then and there, my blood ran cold. Because from beyond the door, I heard these words uttered by my daughter. What do you mean, gifts? Shiny things? Okay, I promise. I watch my fingers as I curl them into my palms. One by one, I force them to open and close. I see them. I feel the skin stretch under the dried blood coating my knuckles, but they don't feel like my hands. Not anymore. A shadow darkens the asphalt below my feet as a pair of white tennis shoes appears beside my work boots. Tip your head back. The paramedic presses her finger under my chin, coaxing my head to rise. I notice the ID badge hanging around her neck. 
Alicia. Her dark skin, kind eyes, and slight smile invite me in, but I force my eyes away. Those people are alive because of you, she whispers and dabs a cloth at the cut along my hairline. The antiseptic burns, but it's not enough to keep my gaze from returning to my hands. No, I whisper. I'm... A loud cough cuts me off. It pulls my attention to another ambulance parked just a few dozen feet away. I glance over just in time to see a man in a suit. A detective, I guess. Step back from a body bag on a gurney. He takes out a notepad and scribbles something down, nodding like he's talking to someone. One of the uniformed officers gathered around the gurney steps forward, and that's when I see him. Craig, my boss. With eyes wild, blonde hair matted against his head from his hard hat, a cigarette pinched between his fore and middle finger, one for each hand. He waves his arm across the parking lot. No doubt he's giving the police an animated description of what he saw from his office window. Then he shoves one of his cigarettes between his lips and inhales hard. It's a familiar motion, one I've seen dozens of times almost every day. My chest aches as I think about what just happened. I flex my hands against the blood caked on my knuckles just to break whatever spell his movement holds over me. I can't look at him. If I do, I might break. This might sting, Alicia whispers, pulling my thoughts back to the here now. She dabs my knuckles with a cloth. Even through the blue rubber gloves she wears, her hand feels delicate in my palm. So small, like my wife's, like Jess's. The thought burns and I take a deep ragged breath to make the pieces floating in my mind fall into place. Nothing makes sense. Not anymore. I suppose I should have seen it coming. All the cutesy stuff died out years ago. The pet names, hand-holding, the little love messages we left for each other to find. I'm not sure when it happened exactly, or why. I guess between both our jobs, trying to keep up with the bills and everything else, we just sort of stopped trying. We fought more, hugged less, until yelling was all we did. And then that stopped too. Almost like neither of us cared enough to even fight anymore. But I was going to change all that. This anniversary was going to be different. I stood at the counter of the flower shop. A little glass jar sat by the register with two sticks of incense poking out of the top. Their thin trail of smoke couldn't compete with the scent of roses and carnations filling the air. A smile pulled at my lips. I couldn't help but wonder if even the smell of roses got annoying after a while. The crinkle of cellophane pulled my attention to the girl working behind the counter as she wrapped my bouquet. She flashed me a tired-looking smile and asked, Who's the lucky lady? My wife. I peeled a couple twenties from my money clip and tossed them on the counter. It's our anniversary today. Ten years. Wow. She blinked, handing me the roses. That's a long time. What's your secret? A chuckle rumbled in my throat. It's one of those questions people always ask, but I don't ever have an answer. So I smiled, tucked the bouquet under my arm, and gave her the response I always give when someone asks before heading out the door. Don't get divorced. I slid into my focus, chucked the flowers on the passenger seat, and checked my phone. Three messages, one confirming the dinner reservations and two from Hank. I talked him into picking up the rest of my shift so I could make today special for Jess. But Hank's an abide-by-the-rules kind of guy. Everything has to be cleared by the boss, and Craig wasn't there. I told Hank it'd be fine that I'd cleared up with Craig later, and I had left him a message, but he hadn't responded yet. I clicked open Hank's message asking if I had heard back. I texted him back that I hadn't, but not to worry. I'd take the heat. Laughing, I tossed the phone beside the flowers on the seat and started the car. Craig and I had been friends for years. There wasn't going to be any heat. I spent the rest of the drive thinking about the time Craig, Jess, and I went on a float trip with him and his latest girlfriend. Triss, or maybe it'd been Alex. It was hard to keep up with. I guess Craig's always been kind of a man whore, but he's a great guy. Quick to laugh and always the first to lend a hand when someone's in need. Pulling off the highway, I turned onto my street, 
replaying the moment the floating beer cooler he brought on that trip disappeared in the rapids in my mind. Thinking about how he ditched his kayak and dove in after it still made me shake my head. When my house came into view, Craig's truck stood waiting in the driveway. I snorted out a laugh. It was just like him to pull something like this. At Christmas, he showed up at midnight in a red suit and beard with a bottle of peppermint schnapps. A big grin pulled at my face as I stopped at the curb and killed the engine. I didn't have any idea what he planned this time, but whatever he was up to, it couldn't take long. He had the next shift at the factory. I grabbed the flowers and my phone from the passenger seat and headed up the driveway. The garage door was open again, third time this week. I muttered as I fumbled the house key free from the others and slid it into the lock, wondering if one of the neighbor's garage door openers was on the same frequency. The scent of cigarettes hit the moment I stepped into the kitchen, slapping my grin into a scowl. I must have told him at least a hundred times not to smoke in the house. I just laid my phone down on the counter when I caught a glimpse of two long stem glasses standing on the table, along with an empty bottle of champagne. I dropped the flowers beside the glasses and flicked the side of the bottle. It didn't make sense. Craig was a beer guy. What did he need champagne? And that's when I see it. The small black dress on the floor by the fridge, halfway between the kitchen and the hallway. I bent down and pinched at the edge of Jess's dress when a low moan drew my attention to the bedroom at the end of the hall. I let the dress slip through my fingers as my mind stumbled to put the pieces together. Oh, God, Craig's voice sighed. My blood turned to ice. I crept to the doorway and glanced down the hall toward my bedroom. There he was. They were. Craig and Jess. Her legs wrapped around his hips. Her fingernails dug into his naked back as he moved over her. I crept further back into the kitchen just as a high-pitched squeal echoed in my ears. It pierced so loud. I couldn't think. Snatching the roses and my phone, I stumbled out of the house, closing the door behind me. Numb. Broken. I needed air. I climbed into the car more like a zombie than a man. Without conscious knowledge, I shoved my key into the ignition. The car roared to life, and I pulled away from the curb. Buildings, cars, and signs drifted past my window like something out of a dream mere shadows that couldn't fully break into the reality playing out over and over in my mind. The stink of Craig's cigarettes, the feel of black silk between my fingers, the rhythmic squeak of the bed. My nails dug into the steering wheel. The deep concrete canyons of the inner city shrunk, replaced by the mind-numbing monotony of suburbia. He had been my friend since high school. We had stuck together even when all our other friends drifted away. I was more than his friend. I was his brother, and this is how he repaid me. I don't know how long I drove, until barbed wire replaced privacy fences, houses became cattle, and the city loomed in my rearview mirror like a storm on the horizon. But I couldn't force the image from my mind. Details I hadn't noticed now etched in my memory, replaying over and over with perfect clarity, driving me mad. Jess's red fingernail polish the slight tremble in her hands as she clawed at him, the little red crescent-shaped marks and scratches down Craig's back. Heart pounding in my ears, my eyes flicked back to the empty two-lane road winding off into the distance. I didn't care where it went. It didn't matter. My life, my marriage, was over. A yellow sign whizzed past my window. I slammed on the brakes and backed up to get a closer look. It wasn't much, just a piece of cardboard nailed to an old wooden fence post. It read, Yard Sale, Tools, Appliances, and Guns, right at the bridge. Guns. I closed my eyes and looked away, but the image came rushing back. Every sound, every scent, Jess's moan. Her fingers curled into Craig's shoulder blades. His shoulder blades... My nose twitched. He had his back to me. And Jess... I summoned the image one more time. She was behind him, under him. I couldn't see her face. My eyes burst open. They didn't see me. They don't know I was there. 
Snatching my phone off the passenger seat, I swiped my finger across the screen. It was only four in the afternoon. I tossed it back onto the seat and shifted the car into drive. It wasn't a plan, not even an idea, more like a feeling, a purpose. Without realizing it, I started to sing, soft and slow. The same tune Dad sung when he went out to the shed to give Mom some space after a fight. The same hymn. Shall we gather at the river? Gravel popped under the tires as I rolled forward, in almost the same rhythm Dad's hammer did as he pounded away at his workbench on those nights. The reservation was for eight. There was no hurry. I had plenty of time. A few hours later, I was at the restaurant. Jess sat across the table. Seeing her in the same black dress I found on the floor earlier sent acid rising in my throat, but I managed to choke it down. I tipped my menu, enough to watch her type a message onto her phone without moving enough to draw her attention. Her face flushed. A smile crept up her cheek and she covered her mouth with her fingers before typing another message. Champagne? I asked, laying my menu onto the table. Her shoulders twitched. Huh? She dropped her phone to her lap and forced an apologetic smile, but her eyes drifted back down before finding me again. Sorry, no, I think I'd rather have some wine. Her eyes twinkled a brief moment but dropped again too quickly. She wasn't there with me. She was with him. Craig. Where bright angel feet have trod. The words echoed in my ears as I picked up the menu again. For that brief moment when her eyes held mine, I had forgiven everything. But now, the image of the paper bag sitting on my workbench in the garage stuck in my mind. The old Remington 870 I had bought at the yard sale. All I needed were the shells. Jess giggled. I lowered my menu. She glanced up at me and rolled her eyes, pretending it was nothing. It's just Sarah from work. She texted me this joke. I'll tell you about it later. Her voice trailed away as her eyes went back to the phone, which she had picked up again from her lap. I wanted to believe her. I wished I could. But the blush of her neck and the rapid rise and fall of her chest left no room for doubt. She lied. The waiter came. When he asked for our order, I leaned forward and indicated the most expensive wine they had. His eyebrow raised and I informed him that tonight was our anniversary and my wife deserved nothing less. He offered his congratulations, complimented Jess on how lovely she looked, but her eyes never left her phone. At first, when the waiter poured the wine and I lifted my glass with an exaggerated, to us, she blinked up from her phone. Her gaze shifted between me and her wine. She took up her glass, swirled the clear liquid, and seemed to be staring at it as a smile spread across her lips, but her gaze focused on an object just beyond the wine. The brightness of the screen shimmered against the glass's surface. To love, she whispered, tapped her glass against mine, and drank. My jaw clenched. This was a farce. I was just about to slam my glass down and storm out when Jess turned off her phone and placed it beside her plate on the table. The muscles in my jaw relaxed. Maybe I was wrong, seeing things that weren't there. I needed to be sure. I set down my wine. So, what was Lisa's joke about? I switched the name of Jess's co-worker with that of her friend, wondering if she had noticed and not sure if I hoped she would. Lisa? Jess puffed out her cheeks and let the air back out again in an obvious search for what I meant. With sudden fervor, she waved her hand dismissively. Oh, that. It was about how she's starting to want to sniff butts when she goes out on dates. You know, like a dog. Since she's a dog walker, it wasn't that funny. Whatever shine her eyes had disappeared as she took her glass and gave the wine a swirl. Ah, sorry. I'm a little slow, I guess. I tried to cough it off, but the muscles in my face tightened in anger. It was so easy for her to sit there, right across the table, and lie to me. Jess reached out and took my hand. Is something wrong? Nah, I grunted. 
I rubbed my thumb across the red polish on her nails, the same nails that dug into Craig's back. My chest ached, but from anger or pain, I couldn't tell. Come on, she lifted my hand and planted a kiss on my knuckles. We've been married for ten years. I know that look. What's on your mind? My gaze lingered on the place her lips touched. I just hoped we could have the evening to ourselves. I tried to ignore the cold numbness left behind from her kiss, like poison. But you've been on the phone all evening. I didn't want it to sound as whiny as it did. She tipped her head to the side. You're right. I'll tell you what, I'm going to run to the john, and when I get back, we'll start over. Just you and me. I nodded. She gave my hand another kiss, and then pushed back her chair, giving my hand one last squeeze as she left. Be right back. I watched her vanish behind a potted plant and then snatched her phone from the table. I typed in her pin and went over her recent texts. All Craig. All about what he was going to do to her the next time he could sneak away. My hand tightened until the plastic creaked. I checked her other texts. The ones just before we left. Jess wasn't lying. Sarah, Lisa, Amy. They had all texted her each one asking about her rendezvous with Craig. The rhythm of Dad's pounding screamed in my head. They all knew. Everyone at the daycare. All her friends. Neighbors. Everyone at work. I clicked back to the screen it was on when she left and laid it back next to her untouched plate. All I could think about was the shotgun. It was a goose gun. The barrel was way too long to hide under my jacket the stock too but that could be remedied I fumbled my time card out of its slot on the rack the same way I did every morning and just like every other morning I slid the paper into the notch and hit the button on the top of the clock wondering if Craig was ever going to update to a new system it thunked just as a rap sounded on the glass behind me my jaw clenched but I swallowed the rage and turned around with my usual morning smirk firmly in place. Craig tapped at his watch from the other side of the window. I forced my jaw to relax. I needed to keep calm and play it cool or they'd win. Taking a deep breath, I shrugged, pantomimed driving, and shrugged again. It wasn't the first time traffic made me late. He shook his head with an understanding nod and sat back down at his desk. Shall we gather at the river? I took my hard hat from its hook on the wall and jammed it on my head. The image of me walking through the door, going to the time clock, and instead of punching in, pulling the gun from under my jacket and shooting him in the head through the glass played through my mind. I fished a couple of foam earplugs from the bin by the door to the factory, pressed them into my ears, and went inside. The dull thrum of heavy machinery vibrated through my body in time with the hymn playing in my mind. No one back here would hear a gun blast. I could kill Craig and be at the daycare before anyone even knew he was dead. It would work. But then I caught a glimpse of the friendly secretary, Mary, sitting at her desk. Dad's pounding faded. She'd notice. Her death would go as smoothly as Craig's, but I didn't want her dead. Her smile was like a ray of sunshine every shift, and her husband was a nice guy too, or so I heard. Pictures of her daughter stretched out like a timeline across her desk, a sweet-looking girl with her mother's smile. Mary never harmed anyone, as far as I knew. It'd be wrong for her to die on account of Craig. I paused and let the thundering noises close in around me before turning to go find the one guy I knew who could help. Mary's special project, Hank. I wasn't sure where they met, but I do know he was down and out in the worst possible way, and she talked Craig into taking him on. Hank was likable enough, friendly, hardworking, eager to please, and reliable. But the guy attracted trouble like flies and garbage. Mary was always out of the office helping with something or other goofy, unexpected things that just shouldn't happen. Like the exploding beans fiasco last week, when he put a can on a hot pipe to warm up without poking a hole in the lid. I snorted back a laugh just thinking about it, but Hank was definitely my best shot at getting her out of harm's way. 
blue tanks three stories high rose up around me like a gigantic six-pack. I ran my hand along the base of the nearest one, feeling for the telltale buzz of a blockage in the line. A smooth rumble coursed through my fingers, and I moved on to the next. Failing Hank, x and her coffee would work, I guessed, but knowing Craig, he'd want a cup too, and I needed him in the office. The tank was clear. I pulled my hand from its warmth and placed it on its neighbor. I could shoot him while he was on the toilet, but Mary or some other poor schmuck might hear and call the police. I'd never make it to Jets. The tank rumbled under my hand. Sludge, I whispered and splayed my fingers out against the smooth surface, searching for the familiar rattle of the outlet valve opening. But it wasn't there. It wasn't functioning. It needed to be opened manually. My gaze jumped to the catwalk at the top of the tanks where Hank should have been, but there was no sign of him. A low rippling crack vibrated through my knuckles. My blood turned to ice. There was too much pressure building. Way too much. If I didn't hurry, it was going to burst. Cursing under my breath, I sprinted to the end of the row and flew up the stairs two at a time. Hank! Hank! But when I got to the control station, Hank wasn't there. Ignoring the warning lights, I bolted down the catwalk and half slammed my shoulder into the wheel on the pressure relief valve. It groaned when I hit it, but nothing else. It wouldn't budge. I braced my foot against the pipe and pulled on the side of the wheel. Come on! It didn't move. I leaned in harder until the tendons in my arms stood out like ripcords, but the wheel refused to turn. Turn, dang you! The ribbon handles casting cut into palms as I jerked the valve back and forth, but it was useless. We were going to lose it. It would be like a bomb going off and set off a chain reaction big enough to take out the entire site. Just as I let go of the wheel and turned for the control station to sound the alarm, Hank barreled past me. Sweat mixed with the white powder coating his face as he jammed a pry bar into the webbing of the wheel and threw his weight against it. I rammed my shoulder into the bar along with him, praying that together could break it loose. The valve cracked. A deep shuddering groan shook the catwalk as Hank pried the valve until it spun freely. Finally, he fell to his knees panting. I flopped down beside him, slapping him on the shoulder as I landed on my backside. My hard hat bounced as it landed between my legs. I tossed Hank a tired smile to let him know it was all good, but he didn't smile back. Instead, he buried his face in his hands. The rumble of the factory made talking impossible, so I reached out my hand to grab his arm and let him know it'd be okay, but my eye caught on the white powder sticking to my hand. I stopped and rubbed the grit between my fingers, but even then it took a second to click as to what it was. Filtrate. I glanced back at Hank's shirt. He was covered in it. I must have gotten it on me when I slapped his shoulder. And that's when it hit me. Mary was seriously allergic to the stuff. I tapped Hank's hard hat and gestured for him to get down to the office. His shoulders slumped, but he nodded, pushed himself to his feet, and shuffled down the catwalk. I watched him go, grinning like an idiot despite the adrenaline buzzing in my ears. I couldn't have asked for anything more. The second Hank walked into the office with that powder on his clothes, Mary would go into anaphylactic shock. She kept an EpiPen handy, so she'd be fine, but it put her out for at least a couple of days. I literally could have kissed him. That evening, I stood at the workbench in my garage, humming. Jess went to bed a while ago, and I had taken to sleeping on the couch months before. Even so, I balanced an empty beer bottle on the doorknob to give warning if she tried to come in. Unlocking my tool chest, I pulled my hacksaw out of the bottom drawer, along with a rat tail file, and laid them beside the vise. I took an old rag from a bucket I kept hanging on a nail off the corner, then glanced back at the automatic garage door to make sure the lock was pressed into the track. Only when I was sure I was alone did I reach up on the shelf and pull my shotgun out of its hiding place behind the boxes of Christmas decorations. It was a strange sensation watching my hands wrap the rag around the action and clamp it in the vise. They moved without feeling. Peaceful. My fingers snugged around the handle of the saw. I pressed the blade against the barrel, just where the magazine stopped, 
and started to saw, wondering if this is what Dad felt when he went into the shop on those nights he and Mom fought. I saw Craig's body moving in the same rhythm of the saw, just as moan echoed in the dull rasp of the blade, but there was no fury, not even a hint of pain. I hadn't planned any of it, not really. Every piece fell into place so neatly, my coming and going unnoticed, the yard sale and gun, the layout of the factory, even Hank's blunder, as if it were destiny. God's judgment for adultery. I was just the tool of his wrath. The barrel broke free. Still humming, I caught it to keep it from banging onto the floor and dropped it into the trash can. I didn't bother to try to hide it. There was no coming back for me. My life would end tomorrow no matter how this was about to play out. I moved to the other side of the vise, positioned the blade behind the round section of the wooden stock and began to saw again. The wood sounded different. I don't know why, but it made me think of Jess's friends who worked with her at the daycare. I knew they'd be there when I went in, but I didn't care. They knew what she was doing, and not one of them told me. They gossiped and laughed at me behind my back. They deserved to die as much as she did. Yes, we'll gather at the river. The words danced from my lips as the stock broke loose in my hand. I tossed it in the trash with the barrel and picked up the file. The only thing I cared about was making sure there weren't any kids there when I showed up. But there wouldn't be. Jess went to work at six. There was a field trip tomorrow. She told me last night she had to have lunch ready for them when they came back at noon. I stuffed the file in the end of the gun and cleaned out the ridge left by the saw. My one regret was what it would do to the kids, knowing what happened, even if they didn't see it. Blowing the dust clear from the opening, I worked on smoothing the butt of the gun to a pistol-like grip. Maybe it'd do them good. When they got a little older and heard why their teacher died, that she was a dirty backstabbing whore who got what she deserved, it'd keep them from doing the same. I ran my hand down the wood. Not perfect, but good enough. I spun the handle on the vise and lifted the gun free. It was lighter now, quicker, almost eager to be used. I put the butt down on the bench so it pointed up at the ceiling, and following the video I found online, unscrewed the cap of the magazine. The spring popped out into my hand, along with the plug, limiting the capacity to three rounds. I chucked it into the trash, pressing the spring back into place, and screwed the cap into position. Five rounds. It wasn't many, and I didn't know how many people would be at the daycare. I needed to practice loading. Picking up the gun, I pressed the little button on the bottom of the finger guard and pumped the action back and forward. It gave a satisfying chunk chunk, so I did it again a few more times before slipping the shells into the bottom of the gun and running them through the chamber over and over again. I practiced all night until the light outside the window over my workbench turned pale pink, until my hands moved on their own, until I was ready. By the time I wrapped the gun in a rag and tossed it onto the back seat of my car, everything about the shotgun felt natural, smooth. I shut the door on the car and went inside the house. Jess was in the kitchen, still in her robe. I watched her pour a pot of water in the coffee maker and etched the last moments we had together into my memory. I didn't know why. I didn't know what I expected. But there was no rage, no love, no regret, just emptiness. Without turning around, she asked, What are you doing in the garage this early? I had a few things I needed to do before I took off this morning. I walked up behind her, slipped my arms around her waist, and planted a soft kiss on her cheek. Our last kiss goodbye. The warmth of her skin against my lips made me wonder if Craig's lips had ever touched her there, if there was any part of her that was truly still and only mine. She twisted out of my arms, opened the cabinet door, and reached for a mug. I'm meeting with a friend after work, so don't wait up. Okay, I sighed, catching sight of her purse on the counter. I'll just order a pizza and find something on Netflix or something. 
I turned around and leaned back against the sink to face her. When will you be back? Late. She flopped the mug down beside me. I slid over to get out of her way, and that's when I see the pack of Trojans tucked in her purse beside her billfold. Okay. I shrugged and pushed off the counter. I have to get ready. Have a good day, sweetie. But if she heard me, she didn't answer. The only words I heard echoed as a faint whisper in the back of my mind. The beautiful, the beautiful river. I nosed into the factory parking lot at quarter to eight. The line of workers outside the door waiting to punch in stretched halfway to the lot made me laugh. You thought you'd show up right in the middle of the morning rush, stupid? But I couldn't be too hard on myself. I hadn't done this before, and one mistake wasn't the end of the world. I turned back out onto the street and headed out to grab a cup of coffee. It was just a matter of time. There was no hurry. In fact, there was no reason in the world not to sit down and have some pancakes while I waited. There was a diner at the next corner. I ordered my food, sat, and had just poured the syrup when a man in a tie-dyed t-shirt flopped down in the chair across from me. Burnt forest, he said. My hand froze, syrup still dripping from the pitcher. Excuse me? He gave a nervous-sounding chuckle and leaned back in his chair. That's what I'm getting off of you, man. Like, some fire came through and burned you out. I dropped the pitcher on the table. I'd really rather be alone, if you don't mind. He leaned forward and folded hands on the table, just staring at me with those hazel eyes. No, you don't. But your chakras are so plugged up with sludge, you don't have a clue what you really want. Shoot, I'll bet you can't feel a damned thing. Chakras? A vein in my forehead twitched. That's just what I need right now, some freaky new age hippie throwback psychoanalyzing me. But I didn't need any drama, not now, so I swallowed and picked up my fork and knife. Please, just go away. I'll go, he said, his eyes boring into mine. But tell me one thing. Do you think it will make it any better? My hand froze with the fork halfway to the plate. Would what make what any better? Let it go, man. His forehead creased. Pain only brings more pain. You need to let her go and move on. Love is the answer. Love and forgiveness. For a second time stopped. This was insane. He didn't know. He couldn't know. Sorry, man, I'm messing this up, huh? A slight smile pulled at the corner of his mouth. I only realized what I am a couple weeks ago. It's wild and I don't have that much figured out yet. But you need help, and that's what I'm meant for, to help people. He reached out and touched my hand. His fingertips brushed against my skin, tingles prickled in my arm, and his eyes went wide. Oh, God! His mouth dropped open and he pulled away. God, I'm just a baby light worker. I'm not ready for this kind of fight. He rubbed his hand like it was in pain, but never took his eyes from mine. Not once. Look, e evil is a living thing, like a parasite that infects everything. He uses people in pain to spread, and it wants you, man, but you have to master it. Don't do this. He reached out his hand again. Let me help you. He blinked, and whatever spell he had over me shattered. I jerked my hand away from him, threw my fork on my plate, and jumped up from the table. I didn't know what was happening, but I didn't need it. Any of it. Without another word, I dumped whatever cash I had in my wallet on the counter by the register and stormed out to my car. He followed me. I could hear him shouting at me all the way across the parking lot. I caught a glimpse of him in the mirror when I backed out. He stared at me for a minute and then glanced over at the factory. I tipped the mirror so I couldn't see him, 
jammed the shifter into drive and peeled out of the lot. Whatever kind of crazy this guy was, I wanted no part of it. My hands wouldn't stop shaking. I looked down at the clock on the radio. Quarter after eight. I wasn't late enough. I should have circled the block a few times to kill time. But that guy... I needed to clear my head. Soon we'll reach the shining river. I sang, my fingertips drumming on the steering wheel in time with Dad's hymn. I pulled into the factory lot, parked in my usual spot, and shut off the engine. But I couldn't get the guy out of my head. His eyes. What he said about the darkness wanting me. I glanced over my shoulder, down the street, at the diner sign peeking up over the treetops, and shivered. I never should have gone there. I should have just parked and waited. Taking a deep breath to steady my hands, I climbed out of the car. It didn't matter. I was here now. My breathing slowed. Even if someone saw the gun, even if they called the police now, I'd have ten minutes at least, probably closer to half an hour before they could get here and it would take time for them to figure everything out, who was even responsible for Craig's murder. By that time, Jess and all her friends would be dead, and I'd be... Laughing, I shut the driver's door and opened the back. I never even thought about trying to get away. I had no idea what would happen after that. I took my jacket off the back seat, shoved my arms in the sleeves, and reached back in for the shotgun. It felt unnaturally cold in my hands. I pressed the button on the bottom of the finger guard and cracked open the action to double check, but I loaded it last night. I didn't want to stand out here loading a gun. Too much time out in the open. Too many opportunities for things to go wrong. Footsteps slammed against the asphalt behind me and I tucked the gun under my jacket. Oh, thank you. God, I made it in time, a voice behind me panted. The guy from the diner. A high-pitched buzz rang in my ears and I gripped the gun tighter. If I shot him now, Craig would hear. He'd run out or hide and everything would be ruined. I didn't know what to do. Look, I know it sucks, he said, still gasping from his sprint. But you can get a divorce. Get a new job and start a new life, a happier life. I'll help carry some of that for you. Let me try, please. His hand pressed against my shoulder. I spun on my heel. The cut on my head burns and the memory's gone, replaced by red and blue lights, the strange quiet murmur of people trying to talk without being heard, and the soft rustle of Alicia's scrubs as she works on my head. She pulls at the gauze taped to my cut and I wince. Sucking a hissing breath through her teeth, she lifts a hand from my temple and whispers, Sorry. She rips a bit of tape from the row of pieces she has stuck to the back of her glove and pushes it against my forehead. Guess pain's a hero's reward, huh? I bite my cheek to stem the pressure building behind my nose. Alicia's wrong. I don't dare say it. If I do, if I say anything... I won't be able to hold back the tears, but I'm no hero. I don't know what I am, but not a hero. A pair of black leather shoes appear alongside Alicia's white ones, and she steps back. I don't look up, not even when the officer clears his throat. <clears> throat> Mr. Wallace, I'm sorry, I know this isn't easy for you, but I need to take your statement. What happened? I take a deep breath. To be honest, a metallic clank cuts me off. I glance over at the other ambulance, at the body bag, as they load the gurney into the back. My shoulders slump. The truth is, but I can't tell him the truth, because I'm not even sure what happened. Did you know him? The detective asks, pointing the back of his pen at the gurney. I shake my head. No, I only met him today. I didn't even know his name. You did meet him before? My chest aches. Yeah. I pull my eyes from the ambulance and cover my mouth to fight against the sobs rising in my throat. I 
just found out my wife was having an affair with my boss, my friend. My voice chokes out and it takes a few moments before I can speak again. I wasn't in a good place, so I stopped for breakfast to buy some time. I... And that's where you met Jeff? The detective finishes. I nod, but notice he called him by name. Jeff. Who was he? Not really sure yet. Sort of a strange drifter. We have a few reports of him harassing people, telling them they needed help. But nothing violent. Not until today. My gut clenches. All he wanted to do was help. Mr. Wallace? The detective asks. I take a deep breath and raise my eyes to his neck. Not his eyes. I'll never look another person in the eye again. I know this isn't easy, but I need to know exactly what happened. Was it a heated exchange at the restaurant? No, but that's not true. Sort of. He said I needed help, and with the affair and all, I showed it at him to leave me alone and stormed out. And that's what triggered him. And after that, what happened when he confronted you here? When did you see the gun? I didn't. I watch as Adam's apple rise and fall as he swallows and scribbles in his notepad. It was 8.30. I got out of my car and... My voice trails away and I have to shake my head to clear the memory but my cheek still tingles where he touched me, where all my pain and rage flowed out of me and into him, like some crazy psychic transfusion, when his eyes turned from hazel to black and he started to sing, Yes, we'll gather at the river that flows by the throne of God. My gaze drops to a yellowish stain on the detective's shirt, half hidden behind a dark blue tie. He had never believed the truth. No one would. So I clear my throat and tell him the part he will believe. He appeared out of nowhere. I just reached in the back seat of my car, grabbed my jacket, slid it on, and there he was. He grabbed my shoulder and spun me around. And that's when I saw the shotgun. I tried to talk him down, but he just kept screaming about how everyone deserved to die. I nod over to Craig, who's still talking to a couple of uniforms. Craig must have seen us through the window. He came running out. The guy pointed the shotgun at him, and that's when I tackled him. I didn't want to hurt him. I just wanted to get the gun away from him. I swear, I never meant to... My voice cracks. But he just kept fighting. He wouldn't stop. That's when the gun went off. The detective stops writing. Mr. Wallace... People think being a hero is a noble thing, but I've been involved in a few shootings and it never feels right. All you can do is console yourself with the knowledge that you did the right thing, that you saved lives. It helps. I know he means well, but his words taste bitter on my tongue. I swallow to clear the flavor and catch a glimpse of Craig pacing back and forth in front of the building, a cigarette still in each hand. But the rage... The hate is gone. Empty. I turn my focus back to my hands. I don't know what Jeff did to me when he touched my face, but one thing I do know, I am not a hero. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. 